Michael Barber, can I ask you a quick question? Sure, who's speaking? Mike Fisher. Yeah, hi Mike, go ahead. I, I'm not clear from the end of yesterday whether I was supposed to send my written comment or whether it was gonna be pulled off the recording. I think we ended up, it's gonna be pulled off the recording. So Christina was going to send the court reporter the final um, section of the hearing. So good morning, everyone. I believe that uh, it is the eight o'clock hour and uh, we'll get started. Um, first things first, I want to announce that uh, at 4.30 today, there will be a public hearing. And um, if we have any time at the end of today's hearing, which will probably be unlikely, um, we could take some comment uh, at the end of this hearing, but it, it uh, might be more appropriate uh, for people to um, join into the time period specifically uh, allotted for uh, public comment. Um, today's focus is the MVP QHP filing. And for the purposes of today's hearing, I am hereby appointing Michael Barber, uh, the hearing officer. And at this time, I will turn over the meeting to Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So good morning. Um, as you heard, I've been designated by the board, uh, board chair to serve as the hearing officer for today's hearing. The purpose of this hearing is to take evidence and argument on MVP Health Plan's 2021 individual and small group rate filing. The docket number for this case is GMCB-006-20RR. The Green Mountain Care Board has jurisdiction over this matter pursuant to Title 18 of the Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 9375, as well as Title 8 of the Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 4062. Representing MVP today are Gary Carnady, Ryan Long, and Michelle Bennett of the law firm Primer Piper, Eggleston, and Kramer. Uh, representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate are Jay Angoff, Kylie Kuiper, and Eric Schulteis. I also want to recognize the board's associate general counsel, Amarin Aberjali, who will be conducting the direct examination of the board's actuaries. Um, Gavin Boyles is also on the line I saw, uh, general counsel for Department of Financial Regulation. Um, because we are holding the hearing remotely today, before I go any further, I want to make sure all the board members, all the attorneys, for the parties can hear okay and can be heard by everyone. So um, I'm just gonna do a, a quick roll call. If I call your name, if you could just uh, let me know if, if your system is working okay. Um, Mr. Chair, we already heard from you. Board Member Holmes? Yes. <clears throat> Board Member Lunge? Yes. Board Member Lucifer? Yes. Board Member Pelham? Yes. Amron? Yes. Mr. Carnady? Yes, and I have uh, watching on the screen next to me, uh, Attorney Long and Attorney Bennett. Great. Mr. Angoff? Yes, sir. Mr. Schulteis? Yes. And Ms. Kuiper? Yes. Great. So and as Mike, we've discussed, before we get started, uh, I didn't announce it today, but I did announce it yesterday. I know it's a little bit cooler, but uh, um, I'm setting the example by not wearing a jacket, recognizing the summer heat. So Gary and Matt, if you uh, wish to take yours off, feel free. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Hearing Officer. <laughs> no. Appreciate that. It was I was sweating all day yesterday, even without the jacket. <laughs> The chair can take judicial notice that I will accelerate my examinations uh, in, in return for this favor. <laughs> so as we've discussed, if at any point um, you get dropped from the call, you have my cell phone number, please text me. I'll pause the hearing, allow you to get back on. Uh, 
yesterday we were on for a long time. We didn't really have any technical issues, so I'm hoping things will go smoothly today. Uh, we are recording today's proceedings uh, via the Teams app. Uh, we also have a court reporter here, Ms. Carson, to just transcribe the proceedings. Uh, I should have checked earlier, but Ms. Carson, are you are you on? I saw you on earlier, I believe. Joanne, can you hear us okay? If you're if you're trying to speak, you're muted. Um, Perhaps Christina could give her a call. Yeah. Do you want us to give her a call, Mike? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I don't want to go any further unless I know we're transcribing okay. Okay. Make sure Thanks. that happens. Oh. I think I just got a text from her. I can hear you. Someone muted her. Okay. Do we she know how to unmute her? She said she can't unmute her screen. Um, Christina, is there a way you can try and do that on our end? There is not a way for me to unmute folks. Um, she, she may need to maybe hang up and call back in, but because I can't figure out why she can't unmute herself. But she says she, she's good to go. She can hear fine, but um, yeah, if you, Joanne, if you wouldn't mind hanging up and calling back in, just, I know sometimes you ask people to repeat themselves for the record and uh, we're not gonna be able to hear that if, um, yeah, she looks like she's leaving. So let's give a couple of minutes and it's a strange new world. Maybe people could test their muting unmuting right now in case anyone else needs to quickly hop off. Test. 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 All right. I was hoping people would start singing something, a little karaoke, something fun. <laughs> We're not punch drunk yet, Jess. <laughs> All right, at like four o'clock today, if we're still on, I'm expecting some singing from Gary, from Matt. You, they'll end the hearing quickly if I start singing, believe me. <laughs> Give it the screen, I think we could sing the Brady Bunch. The from the Brady Bunch. <laughs> it's the story. I'm back. Good morning. I'm here. Great. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble with my mouse. So uh, it looks like we have. 37 attendees in the meeting, um, most of whom I can see are here. We have a couple of phone numbers. The, the board has been basically doing a roll call for its board meetings since people may be coming and going throughout today's proceedings. I don't think we need to do that. Um, is, does anyone think we need to take a roll call attendance of people who are here on the phone. Nope. Okay. So for any members of the public who are present, uh, 
like the chair said, we will, we will be taking public comment at the close of the, the proceedings today. Um, however, it's unclear when that will be. Um, so I can't say when we'll get to the public comment portion of the meeting. And um, if you don't want to sit through uh, what's going to be hours of testimony, we have a meeting this afternoon from 4.30 to 6.30 that is dedicated exclusively to hearing from the public on this filing and the other uh, individual and small group rate filing from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Information about how to participate in that meeting can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website and um, clicking on the rate review tab. Additionally, you can submit written comments to the board uh, via our website or by regular mail. We will be taking public comments on this filing through July 23rd. Uh, please do not use the, the chat function of Teams. If you're on the computer, um, that's going to be very distracting for all of us. Um, at this point, oh, we already did the microphone check, muting check. Um, so the last thing before we begin, I just want to remind the board and the parties to exercise caution regarding any information in the binders that has been marked confidential as these matters can't be discussed in a public setting. Uh, the parties have marked documents that contain confidential materials as confidential in the hearing binders. And Mr. Connerty, I, I wonder if you could just uh, explain to the board how the material is designated because it there's a bit of a difference between the way MVP did it this year and the way Blue Cross did it. Um, just to remind the board how it's how it's set out in the binders. I'm happy to do that. I was going to uh, walk through uh, the exhibit list and explain that in uh, Mr. Lombardo's uh, exam. So I can do it at that time if you if you like. That's fine. Okay, so let's get into the exhibits. Um, we received binders on July 16th with 33 bait stamped exhibits. Um, I understand the parties have stipulated to the admissibility of these documents. Um, the binder also contains three uh, exhibits, HCA exhibits marked A through C that I understand the parties have not stipulated to. And uh, on Friday afternoon, we received four additional exhibits from MVP labeled D through G that I understand the parties have stipulated to as well. Am I understanding all that correctly? Okay, yes, I, just want to, I just want to check to make sure the board members have all those documents. Do you have the documents readily available that came in on Friday exhibits D through G? Does anyone not? I guess. Looks like everyone does. OK. Um, Mr. Carney, I do have a question about exhibit G. Uh, which is the solvency opinion for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Can you tell me why the majority of that document has been redacted? I think it goes to uh, relevance. We basically have uh, left two paragraphs where uh, the commissioner discusses some uncertainty about around returning premium. That's all we wanted to ask about, and I thought it would be inappropriate uh, to have the balance of information about Blue Cross Blue Shield solvency in this hearing. It has nothing to do with this hearing. Okay. Do you have unredacted copies available should the testimony or the questioning um, require require that? Uh, we can certainly get those. I I my expectation is that uh, anything beyond those two paragraphs wouldn't be relevant to these proceedings. I probably object to that, um, but we can certainly, uh, my team can get copies of those made certainly. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming neither party has any objection to me ad ad admitting uh, exhibits one through 33 and exhibits D through G at this time. Is that correct? correct. 
No objection. Okay, so then I will do that at this time. Um, so that leaves exhibits A through C. Mr. Angoff, how do you plan to introduce documents A through C? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, I'm sorry, I'm unfamiliar with those exhibits. Maybe uh, Ms. Kuyper or Ms. Schult Mr. Schulteis could address them. Sure. Um, we would like to move uh, the board to take administrative notice of exhibits A through C. Um, both, all three documents are statistics provided by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, they're relevant because they speak to the price shocks that Vermonters are currently experienced. Unlike um, in the past, we felt that because the coronavirus um, and the economic fallout is evolving so rapidly that we wanted to provide monthly data so we could get a sense of what things are looking like in May and June um, and that yearly estimates were not going to be helpful to the board. Mr. Carney, do you have any objection to me I taking administrative notice? I do. Uh, all three exhibits uh, reference percent changes in the CPIU for all urban consumers, urban consumers, and uh, Exhibit A, in fact, the documentation that comes along with it indicates uh, on a technical note that not including the CPI are the spending patterns of people living in rural, non-metropolitan areas, farming families, et cetera. So the, the, the general objection is this data relates to people who live in the city. There are, I love Vermont, but there aren't really any uh, urban areas, and this just isn't relevant. Uh, to Vermonters, and I would add that uh, we've stipulated a number of other exhibits, some of which come from the Vermont Department of Labor uh, and are going into evidence. So I don't think there's any harm. This is just piling on. So just for clarity, um, our position is that, you know, CPI is widely accepted statistic. Um, unfortunately, these numbers are not released for, for at a state level, nor are they released by uh, the state of Vermont. Um, you know, this is a known um, drawback of inflation numbers. Um, and I think rather than exclude the evidence uh, for that, um, we have a relatively a knowledgeable triers of fact here and that they can give the evidence the weight it deserves. The last point on that, I think that uh, using your common sense, uh, these shouldn't go in. Um, if you bought a cup of coffee uh, or a beer in uh, Vermont in a cabin, um, that's a totally different experience than buying a beer down in New York City. So using your common sense, um, I just don't think that, that this data is relevant. So we would object to that. Beyond relevance, I have any objection to the admissibility of the documents in terms of authentication, um, things like that? Oh, no, absolutely not. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to admit them. Um, I do think they're relevant to the issue of affordability and the weight they should be afforded is uh, a question that the board can figure out. So I'm gonna admit exhibits A through C at this time. So is there anything we need to address before we get into opening statements? Mr. Angoff? No, sir. Okay, then um, Mr. Carnegie, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, we've indicated, my name is Gary Carnady, and my law firm, uh, Firmer and Piper, represents MVP again this year in the 2021 rate filing. 
2020 has been an extraordinary year with this pandemic. MVP, the Department of Financial Regulation, and this board have risen to the challenge of addressing the complexities of COVID in the world of health insurance. For this 2020 rate filing, the evidence will show that the actuaries for L&E and MVP are in agreement on 15 out of the 16 factors l &E identified in its memorandum this year. The evidence will show that MVP is now seeking an increase of 6.06%. The evidence will show that l &E has recommended a rate increase of 5.38%. This difference is around 0.6% percent depending on rounding. The one issue of disagreement this year is the extent to which COVID will impact rates in 2021. The evidence will show that both l and &E and MVP recognize that due to COVID disruptions, even higher premium increases may be required than what they propose. As to the 0.6 difference, they disagree by about 0.3 on whether pent up demand for surgeries will impact the rate. They disagree by about 0.3, so the other half, on how COVID vaccinations will impact the rate. They disagree on the extent of the impact and how to account for it in the rate increase. We believe l and &E is correct on 15 out of the 16 of its rate factor opinions, which amounts to 94%, which is an A, but it's not an A plus. This disputed issue is very important. MVP's conclusions on COVID are actuarially sound and reasonable. We believe MVP is making tough calls this year, measuring risk and uncertainty based on sufficient data and expertise which is what actuaries get paid to do. We believe the weight of the evidence and the common sense of the board in considering these issues will result in adoption of MVP's 6.06% rate increase request and a rejection of l &E's rationales on this one rate factor difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carnady. Mr. Angoff, do you have an opening statement? Yes, I do. Good morning, Mr. Hearing Officer. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. This year, for the first time, we're asking the board to give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. This is not what MVP does, and it's not MVP's job to give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. And clearly, that's not what l and &E has historically done either. You remember last year, uh, l and &E said MVP wasn't asking for enough money that they should be charging Vermonters more. So what we're asking more than MVP asked for. It. So what we're asking the board to do is for the first time to give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. And we're asking that for three reasons. First, this year, people obviously are suffering more than they ever have before because of the coronavirus pandemic. Second, unlike Blue Cross, MVP's surplus is not an issue in this case, no matter what the increase or decrease that the board orders for MVP this year, it'll have a minimal effect, a nominal effect on MVP surplus. Now that doesn't mean that the board that, that if that, that doesn't mean that the board should disregard the facts, of course not. But if there's a range, and there always is a range, the board should err on the side of giving the benefit to the policyholder, not to MVP. Third, there is so much uncertainty this year. Blue Cross has said it, MVP said it, and will continue to say it. With so much uncertainty, Again, that's, a, that's another reason that the board should give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. Second point I'd like to make. The amount that MVP has paid out in 2020 
It's already got six months of paid claims data. It is very, very important, both in determining what the rate increase or decrease should be for 2021, and also in determining, assuming that the board believes it has this power, and I, I don't know whether it does or not, but if the board believes the, that it has this power, it should consider whether to order a rebate for 2020 rates in connection with 2020 rates. So I just ask the board to look carefully at the data that MVP has disclosed about their paid claims in 2020 and look equally carefully at the analysis that l and &E has done regarding those paid claims and regarding what it thinks those paid claims will ultimately result in in 2020 and to make its own decision as to the level of increase or decrease to order in 2021 and whether or not to order a rebate for 2020. Third point, MVP gives us all a terrific opportunity to see how much difference there is between Vermont, which has done the best job, which has the fewest coronavirus case, virus cases in the country, and New York, which has the most. So I think it's very important to look at the assumptions that MVP has made regarding uh, how the coronavirus will affect claims in Vermont and compare those to the assumptions it's made as to how the coronavirus will affect claims in New York. So finally, I'd just like to conclude by saying, by emphasizing again, please give the benefit of the doubt. There's always a range. There's no one perfect, one correct uh, assumption for any element. Please give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. If MVP has disclosed sufficient data that you believe it has made a clear and convincing case that its assumption should be adopted by the board, then adopt that assumption. But if MVP has not disclosed sufficient data to allow the board to conclude that it, is, that it has made that clear and convincing case, please give the benefit of the doubt to the policyholder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Angoff. I'm just going to check on Tom Pelham. I don't know if maybe he had a bird flying the stove again, but I don't see you on video. Are you still there? You are. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, Mr. Carney, uh, would you like to call your witness? MVP calls Matt Lombardo, please. Okay, let's all just take a minute to pin Mr. Lombardo if that's what you're doing and doing. Okay, Mr. Lombardo, are you ready to take the oath? Yes. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, Mr. Carney. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Matt. Good morning, Gary. Bright and early. Would you uh, please state your full name? Matthew Lombardo. And Matt, uh, who's your employer? MVP Healthcare. And uh, as I understand it, the filer of this rate filing is MVP Health Plan Inc., correct? Correct. What's the relationship between those two entities? MVP Health Plan Inc. is the nonprofit HMO legal entity under the MVP Healthcare umbrella. And what's your position at MVP? Senior Leader of Actuarial Services. And do you have any professional uh, memberships or certifications? I'm a fellow in the Society of Actuaries, and I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. And how long have you worked in the healthcare insurance industry? About 15 years. 
And how many years at MVP? Uh, 12, 12 and a half years, approximately. And uh, can you tell the board your involvement in Vermont rate filing for MVP at the Green Mountain Care Board? Yeah, so um, since the ACA rolled out in 2014, um, I've, I've overseen the small and individual Vermont merge market rate filings every year. So this is the seventh rate filing, eighth, seventh, eighth rate, or rate filing I'm working on. Okay. And uh, what are your job duties at MVP? Um, in addition to pricing uh, and setting premium rates, I'm responsible for forecasting our state programs in New York and commercial lines of business, uh, reserving or IBNR, um, financial competitive intelligence. I, I oversee uh, value-based arrangements and uh, strategic initiatives. Matt, could you turn to the exhibit binder, please, and go to the exhibit list? Okay. And what I want to do is just walk through these exhibits. They're all in evidence now, but sort of acclimate everyone to what we have and uh, what you have knowledge of, okay? Okay. So if you look at exhibits one through seven on the list, that includes MVP's rate filing, responses to objections, and uh, you'll also note that, for example, exhibit two has a 2A, which references confidential, so the lettered exhibits are the confidential versions, the complete versions uh, of the exhibits, correct? Correct. And you're familiar with uh, one through seven, uh, correct? Correct. And exhibit eight is your CV that you prepared, correct? Correct. Exhibit nine is your July 7th pre-filed testimony, correct? Correct. You've reviewed it and are familiar with it, right? Yes. And Exhibit 10 is the uh, L&E actuarial opinion of July the 7th, their memorandum, correct? Correct. You've reviewed that and are familiar with it? Yes. Exhibit 11 is a DFR solvency analysis letter that relates to MVP, correct? Correct. And you've reviewed that and you're familiar with it? Yes. And Exhibit 12 is an actuarial standard uh, Crash standard of practice number 26, correct? Correct. You've read that and are familiar with it? Yes. And exhibit 13 is MVP's calculation of LE's July 7th actuarial memorandum rate impact, correct? Correct. And uh, you prepared that and are familiar with it, right? Yes. And then exhibit 14 is MVP's supplemental pre-filed testimony. You authored that and are familiar with it, correct? Correct. And then Exhibit 15 is pre-filed testimony of Jackie Lee, Ms. Lee of l &E, correct? Correct. And you've read that and are familiar with it? Yes. Okay. And then if you would please go to the third page third page of the exhibit list you'll see a heading well let me know when you're there Matt I'm there you see a heading MVP health plan Inc you see that and there's there's lettered exhibits D E F and G yes so uh, exhibit D that's the DFR emergency rule on COVID correct correct and you're familiar with that yes and Exhibit E is a draft. It should say draft in the list. It doesn't, but a draft insurance bulletin from, from DFR, correct? Correct. And then uh, skip over F. Uh, exhibit G is the DFR letter uh, regarding Blue Cross Blue Shield this year, uh, which has been uh, redacted and has those two paragraphs that you heard uh, Hearing Officer Barbara and I discuss, correct? Correct. And you're familiar with those two paragraphs, right? Yes. So these exhibits that we just went over, uh, that we reviewed, that include statements from MVP, as to those you've reviewed them or familiar with them, and then off them as your testimony, correct? Correct. Okay. And as we've done in prior years, in the bottom right-hand corner of the exhibits, 
there should be colored numbered pages. And as we go through this, uh, I'll do my best to reference those page numbers. And if you could do the same. Okay. Okay, Matt. So first I want to start with an explanation of the rate increase at a high level. Um, what is what was the original request for rate increase in MVP's original filing? In our proposed filing that we submitted on May 8th, MVP requested 7.34% increase to our 2020 rates. Okay, Matt, would you please go to exhibit 10 in the binder? Exhibit 10 is LE's memorandum. And if you would go to page 17, please. Okay, I'm there. And you see there's two tables on this page. I want to focus on the one at the bottom that's entitled Components of 2021 Recommended Rate Increase. Do you see that? Yes. And in the bottom right hand corner, it shows LE's recommendation of a total rate change of what amount? LE's recommended rate change is approximately 5.5%. And uh, thank you. So if you would go to exhibit 13, please. Exhibit 13. Okay. And on page two, there's a uh, MVP calculation of LE's actuarial memorandum rate impact. Do you see that, the title of the document? Yes. So, uh, as I understand it, this year, the board asked MVP to check the math, check the calculation of LE's assumptions and run it through the rate filing uh, to confirm that their 5.5 number uh, as a matter of math is accurate. Is that a fair summary? Yes. And uh, what does this memorandum, Exhibit 13, show? So LNE's opinion had approximate rate changes, um, and there were three changes that were made. So everything was an approximation. MVP took those uh, recommendations from LNE's opinion and put them into our actual rate filing to see what the tr what the actual calculated amount was, removing the approximation. The result was that the rate increase based on LNE's recommendations would actually be a 5.38% increase, not 5.5 as they had estimated. So that's not changing any of their assumptions or questioning anything they've done. It's just double checking their math. Is that right? That's right. Would you please go to exhibit 15? And this is the pre-filed testimony of uh, Jacqueline Lee. Okay. Go to, and go to page number seven, please. Okay. And are, are you familiar with, uh, on page seven, there's uh, two Q&As. Uh, are you familiar with those? Yes. And what is Ms. Lee saying here about the, the change to the 5.38? Uh, in row 10 of this exhibit and this page, she states, we believe that 5.38% is a reasonable computation of the impact of our recommended modifications because our calculation was based on estimates of numbers provided by MVP. We rely on MVP's calculation of the 5.38% as they have all the specific figures and formulas to determine the rate change more accurately. Matt, I couldn't hear you clearly because of age, but... It sounded like you said 5.3. Doesn't it say 5.38? It, it does say 5.38. Okay. So uh, we have agreement with L&E on the, on the math through up to 5.38, correct? Correct. Would you go back to exhibit 10, please? Okay, I'm there. And that uh, on page 17, that table we were looking at, the uh, recommended rate increase table on the bottom. I'm there. How many rating components did l &E identify? 16. Okay, and again, this is high level at this point. 
of those 16, uh, how many did they identify changes on where MVP's rate should be reduced in their opinions? Um, well, they, they identified three changes. Two of them are reductions. One of them is actually a immaterial increase. Okay, so is the, is the first change item four? Yes. And does that relate to the COVID disagreement we have, respectful disagreement that we have? Yes, it does. And uh, item 10 looks like another change. Oh, excuse me. What's the amount approximately of the uh, COVID dispute on item four? Approximately 0.6%. And uh, then item number 10 says change to risk adjustment, correct? Correct. And uh, that's a change of, of approximately what? 1.1%. And do we agree with that adjustment? Yes. Okay. We'll talk about that in more detail later. And then uh, there's an item 12. This may have been what you were making reference to. Can you explain item 12 and the footnote and whether this is material? Sure, I, I'd start by saying it's it's an immaterial amount. It's uh, zero, it's 0.02%. Um, and what this represents is all the plan designs submitted have to be metal level compliant per the ACA regulations. Um, one of the plan designs submitted by MVP, which is under review by DFR, was out of compliance with the bronze metal level. Uh, as a result, through their form review, we had to make a modification to the plan design, which resulted in increase in benefits. That increase in benefits has an overall rate impact of 0.02%. Uh, so let's go to the bottom line then. Go to exhibit 14, please. Okay. And this is your supplemental pre-filed testimony that was filed after you got Eleni's report, correct? Correct. If you would go, you see how there's Q and A's. If you would go to Q and A four, which is on page three. Okay. And you can refer to that, but my question is, uh, what can you describe to the board as a result of the agreement with l &E, what the reduction is from our original filing? Sure, as you referenced earlier, uh, we agree with the risk adjustment change and the change in the actuarial value. We disagree with l and &E's recommendation for our ch changes to our COVID assumption. So if we take Eleni's recommended changes for risk adjustment and the actuarial value, uh, we arrive at a 1.28% reduction from the 7.34% proposed increase for an ultimate rate request of 6.06%. So the delta this year between Eleni and uh, MVP is 0.6, correct? Approximately 0.6%. Um, if you would go back, please, to Exhibit 10, Eleni's Memorandum, Exhibit 10. Okay. And go to page 16, please. Okay. And do you see there's a section, Recommendations, and then there's five bulleted items below. Do you see that? Yes. So. Again, this is high level just to identify issues for the board that we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, the first item uh, references considering updated hospital budget information. Do you see that? Yes. And do we have general agreement on that? Yes. And the second item we've talked about, that's the COVID adjustment. That's where we have disagreement, correct? Correct. And uh, what is the third item and do we have agreement on that? The third item relates to the unified rate review template, which is a federal template called the URRT. Um, essentially, l &E, in the instructions for, for the URRT, um, it directs carriers to place the, the net reinsurance factor into a different location than where MVP put it. We agree with l &E that we should move it. It has no impact on the actual rates. 
And the next item is the updated uh, risk adjust adjustment, which we've already referenced, and you'll talk about in more detail in a moment, correct? Correct. And then the final item is this updated actuarial value. Is that what you just discussed, the non-material 0.02? Yes. So as you sit here today of the 16 factors, we agree on 15 of them, correct? That's correct. All right, so let's talk about where we, what we don't agree on, and that would be uh, the COVID issue. That first I wanna talk about MVP's position on it, then I wanna talk about l and E's position on it and the differences, okay? Okay. So let's, let's uh, go to, I think you had some pre-filed testimony on this. Uh, go to exhibit 9A. I would note that's a confidential exhibit, but I don't believe you'll be talking about anything confidential. But I just want the board to have the whole item in front of them. Okay. And there's a section on COVID that starts at page 20, Matt. If you go to page 20. Okay. I'm just, Matt, I'll do some pauses because I'm going to watch the board and see if they've caught up to us where we're at, okay? That works I for see, me. I see nods, okay. Uh, I, I, how, does, how does the board like our big thick binder this year? It's really easy to go through, isn't it? We're concerned that you might be charging by the page, Gary. <laughs> it's by the I word, will. actually. Uh, but this is on As the record. I. <laughs> I should stop, stop talking. Okay, so Matt, we're going to talk about COVID, and as I indicated, starting at page 20, you discussed this in your pre-filed testimony, correct? Correct. So it's an important issue. I want to expand on it a little bit, um, and we want to talk about how the COVID pandemic is impacted uh, and affected MVP's proposed 2021 rates. So let me ask you this question first. Um, there's been decreased utilization in uh, the early part of 2020, correct? Uh, yeah, January and February were pre-pandemic levels, so they were normal, but um, we did see decreases to pay claim volume in March, April, and May. In June, though, uh, across our enterprise, we did see paid levels return to much more uh, normalized expectations, more like pre-pandemic levels. Okay, so could you explain to the board, and take your time, uh, how this the decrease in utilization in 2020 will result in, in your opinion, an increase in utilization in 2021. Sure. Um, so for approximately two months, uh, elective procedures were canceled due to all the stay at home orders that were in place. And um, essentially MVP analyzed the cost of elective procedures across our commercial block, they were approximately the same in New York and Vermont. It was around $45 per member per month. Um, and we recognize that COVID, that number of cases is different in New York versus Vermont, but the fact that um, there were state home orders and cancellations impacted both states in a similar fashion. Once um, we're, all, we're now assuming that providers are gonna be able to increase capacity for two reasons. One is that patients need care. Uh, so if somebody had a bad shoulder or a bad knee or and they deferred an elective procedure, um, we're assuming that the provider community wants to actually treat patients, that's what they do. And they're gonna find a way to help uh, bring less pain or you know to, to solve this issue for their patients. The second item is, <coughs> excuse me, is that we're assuming that 20% of elective procedures are just gonna be outright canceled. Uh, that was based on a 2010 Society of Actuaries paper where they have a range of five to 20% of procedures were canceled. So we actually went with the higher end, which has the least amount of impact going forward. Um, and it basically went from a moderate scenario at 5% to a severe uh, pandemic scenario was at 20%. So what we're assuming is that if you cancel 20% of procedures, but providers increase uh, increase their capacity, which was based on our you know conversations with our medical management team, they did they did confirm 
that elective procedures are generally done at full capacity, but based on conversations we've had with providers, um, we know that they're willing to work extra hours, work weekends, et cetera, to, to do exactly what we talked about, which is to provide care to patients as well as make up for lost revenue uh, in those two months. So the way we modeled it out was that it would take a little bit of time for providers to implement this increase in capacity. It's not something that we assume they could turn the switch on immediately. So we assume that beginning in August of 2020, providers would operate at a 10% additional capacity, so 110%. And that's using two months of COVID, stay-at-home orders and cancellations of elective procedures and no further outbreaks of COVID. Um, with that assumption, there would be four months of elective procedures that should have happened in 2020 that will actually occur in 2021. At that point, as of the end of April, we estimate that providers will all be caught up, the system will be caught up. Um, the approximate impact of that is $4.51 for the four months of January through April. Since we charge calendar year rates and we don't charge monthly rates that vary, uh, we took $4.51 and divide it out by three since it's a third of the year to get to a dollar fifty PM PM impact. Could you just clarify, so there's a window of time that MVP for the reason you just said, that MVP is considering that providers will perform at 110%. When does that window start and when does it end? It starts in August of 2020 and it would end in April of 2021. Thank you. Well, Matt. Um, as an actuary, to have a statutorily adequate rate for 2021, do you consider whether individual treatments or surgeries that take place in 2021 are scheduled in 2020? Said a different way, does it matter when they're scheduled or when the treatment and cost is actually incurred? Can you explain that? It matters when the treatment actually occurs. Um, we set our rates to be actuarially sound and we included an exhibit which is actuarial, actuarial standard of practice number 26, which speaks to what actu defining actuarial soundness. Actuarial soundness is when you set your premiums in such a way that will cover claims, overhead, reinsurance recoveries, et cetera, for the time period where you're collecting premiums. In this case, we're setting premiums for calendar year 2021. So if we expect an increase in claims in a portion of 2021, our premiums should reflect that to, to be an actuarially sound rate. Matt, would you go to page 22 of exhibit 9A, please? Okay. And you see, this is on the issues we're talking about. Do you see A32 at line three? Yes. The second sentence, would you read the second sentence, please? starting with according to. Um, according to actuarial standard of practice number 26, section 2.1, actuarial soundness is de defined as for business in the state for which the certification is being prepared and for the period covered by the certification, projected premiums in the aggregate, including expected reinsurance cash flows, governmental risk adjustment cash flows and investment income are adequate to provide for all expected costs, including health benefits, health benefit settlement expenses, marketing and administrative expenses, and the cost of capital. The next sentence, therefore. Therefore, MVP must consider health claims expected to incur in and only in 2021 when setting premium rates that are effective for 2021. If MVP were to reduce it in 2021 for claims that were expected to occur but did not in 2020, those rates would be considered inadequate based on actuarial principles. Okay, Matt. So what actual what actuarial concerns do you have if the board reduces rates for 2021 based on reduced 2020 claims in the recent months during the COVID crisis? the actuarial soundness of the rate that would be approved would be in question and it would be concerned. So uh, why aren't you assuming that 2021 is going to be the same as 2020? Well, we did model out um, 
various scenarios, but what we're really looking at is when the state home orders went in place in March and April and early May, um, we were just learning. We didn't really know much about the COVID pandemic, and we've learned a lot in the last four months. And um, as time has gone on, we've figured out ways to move throughout our lives cautiously and intelligently to minimize the spread of the virus as a result of that. Uh, and we expect to continue to learn more and more about that over the course of the year and, and until this pandemic is squashed. Um, and you know, as a result, we expect 2021 utilization levels to look more like 2019 utilization levels. So we're using 2019 data, our base data, to set our rates projected into 2021 for any expected changes in unit cost, utilization, or uh, in this case, pent up demand or vaccinations. So because we expect, because we we somewhat figured out how to move intelligently through our lives, which is supported by the fact in healthcare that we are seeing our paid claim volume start to go back to pre-COVID levels, uh, we expect 2021 to look a lot more like 2019. And as to 2020, um, are there, do you have any concerns about as you sit here today in the middle of July, what, what 2020 is actually gonna look like the whole year? And there's a lot of uncertainty um, about what 2020, how 2020 will ultimately play out. As I mentioned, we did see suppressed claims for a few months. And but in June, we did see claims uh, renormalized back to pre-pandemic levels. And what also isn't known is, was the deferred care or the lack of utilization for those few months where there was not only stay at home orders and, and cancellation of elective procedures, but also just a general societal fear of going to the doctor or something like that until we learn more about the virus. <coughs> um, excuse me. Um, we, we are, we, we do expect to see 2021 come to more normalized levels, but the rest of 2020, as those services were canceled or deferred, it's unclear if that's actually gonna to lead to a higher morbidity state, which could actually lead to higher costs over time. That's gonna take time to play out. That may not even be by the end of 2020, that may be into 2021 or even 2022. And do you have the 2020 risk adjustment yet? We do not have 2020 risk adjustment. We received 2019 risk adjustment uh, this past Friday. And, and how would help that help you in terms of determining what's going to happen in 2020? Rates are set to be actuarially sound, uh, or in and to be to the market-wide average rate level or the market-wide average risk level. So we receive risk adjustment from CMS uh, on an annual basis. We don't receive the first five months of the year or six months of the year risk adjustment level, and. What we have to do is take our claims, and if we're paying into the system, which means we have uh, a less morbid population than our competitor, and they have a higher morbidity population, risk adjustment levels the playing field, so that we're on the same, so that you're you're removing morbidity from the equation and how we're setting our premium rates. Uh, we don't have that information for 2020. We only have it for 2019. It's unclear right now exactly how 2020 is even going to play out as a result of this, um, but time will tell, and we'll see as as time goes on. Next, I want to ask you about uh, the impact of a potential vaccine. Would you please go to page 21? You'll see at the top of 21, there's a paragraph that starts additionally, first full paragraph. That's where we start talking a bit about vaccines. But I would just want to ask you uh, to please describe uh, your thoughts about uh, vaccine and how that might impact rates. Sure. MVP um, hopes that there's a vaccine as soon as possible, and we're watching the news uh, very, very closely to see how that's progressing. So, one, so that we can return to our lives, too, so that you know society and people don't have to continue getting sick with this virus and potentially passing away as a result of it. Um, so, well, we're what we're monitoring progress of vaccines. When we set our rates in May, we we were aware that uh, the government was setting out expectations through Operation Warp Speed to accelerate the approval process of a vaccine. We also are aware that um, there's, it feels like almost every biopharmaceutical company or pharmaceutical manufacturer is researching and developing some sort of vaccine. 
Um, so our hope is that in early 2021, we don't have an exact time, just in early 2021, a vaccine will be uh, approved and widely available to the, to the public. Uh, Matt, would you please go to exhibit two, which is one of the interrogatories and page six of that exhibit. Okay, I'm there. Yeah. Exhibit two, page six. Okay, uh, Matt, there were some interrogatory questions and responses around uh, COVID and the vaccine issue. So I just want to refer you to those. Uh, first, there's a question about immunization costs. Would you tell the, the board about that, please? That's, sure, uh, MVP. 13, interrogatory 13. Yep. Uh, the Wakely Consulting Group provided a study where they're estimating how COVID, um, COVID vaccination costs and they use Tamiflu as a baseline for their estimate of, a, of an inoculation cost. Um, MVP used that assumption, but based on our own data and our own cost of Tamiflu, which was $75 per dose. So we're assuming that each vaccine will cost $75. And uh, question 14 goes to immunization rate. Would you please discuss that? Yeah. So also included in the Wakely paper was an assumption that 80% of the population would uh, would have a would accept a COVID vaccine, um, and we we thought that seemed like a reasonable balance between where the flu vaccine uh, rate is of 55% and something that's you know a vaccination that you provide to children like MMR, which is north of 90%. Um, What's MMR? Measles, mumps, rubella. You said that's north of 90%? Yes. And uh, so that's the immunization rate. And then the next question, 15, asks about uh, the date when it might come, become available, the vaccine. Could you talk about that? Yep. Um, as I referenced a few minutes ago, we recognize that the government, as well as uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, are working as fast as possible day and night to try to to try to you know stop this pandemic so that people can return to normalcy and no one else has to get sick from this um and our hope is that a vaccine will be approved in early 2021 uh, there's recent news from a few mar pharmaceutical manufacturers that are going to enter phase two phase three trials um and we're we're hoping that those go according to plan and that there is actually a vaccine available at some point in early 2021 when you say, not a chemist, you say entering phase two and phase three, what does that mean about phase one? It means that phase one um, proved that they were safe. And um, I don't know all, a whole a whole lot, but my understanding is that phase one is a safety trial. Phase two, phase three is more of an efficacy trial um, on top Fair of enough. that. And some, a there's been some success at least with phase one. Is what you're saying. That's correct. Uh, staying on this exhibit, if you go to the next page and you'll see on page seven, there's an interrogatory 17. Let me know when you're there. Okay. And this is a discussion, a question around this, any second wave of the coronavirus. Would you talk about that, please? Sure. Um, you know, we recognize that this pandemic is ongoing and that it's not something that's solved for. So we did model out uh, numerous scenarios what with either more months of an outbreak in 2020 or more months of outbreak in 2020 as well as 2021. In our modeling, uh, what's reflected in our rates is two months of deferred services being suppressed and canceled, and then no more future outbreaks in 2020 or 2021. If we were to assume um, an increase in the months of outbreak or stay-at-home orders, cancellation of procedures for 2020, we would actually experience uh, a $4.51 increase to our rates for the full year. So that's three times the amount. That's basically the 10% capacity increase that we're gonna see for January through April and our assumptions. 
What that's essentially saying is that if there are more months of outbreak, uh, the provider system will not be able to catch up by the end of 2021. And that they could actually, that deferral could actually bleed into 2022. If there is another outbreak in 2021, um, that will actually lead to a suppression of claims similar to what we experienced in, uh, in, the, in the early spring. Would you go to exhibit five, please? Exhibit five. And it's the third page of that exhibit. Exhibit five, page three. Okay. Okay, so uh, there's an interrogatory that starts on the very bottom, number eight. And it asks about COVID's effect on non-benefit costs, such as travel, overhead, profit, adju claims adjudication, et cetera, et cetera. Would you please speak to those issues? Sure. Um, MVP's administrative costs are, so in some areas, they are higher because of our working from home and and uh, the, the pandemic. In other areas, they're decreased. Still too early to tell exactly how 2020 is going to play out in full, but our expectation is that 2021, similar to our claims costs, will look much more like 2019 pre pandemic. So, as a result, we're using 2019 data with an adjustment for um, any changes to our administrative costs or expected administrative costs until 2021, and no adjustments being made for what's happening in 2020. Still too early to tell. And, uh on that page four, the next page, there's a interrogatory nine, which asks about consumer savings in light of hope. There's a number of bullets under here. You see those bullets? Yes. I'd ask you to walk through those bullets and explain those savings to the board. Sure. Um, before the bullets, we, I, I will add that MVP rolled out a brand agnostic uh, website called tritelemedicinefirst.com. Um, it's a it's a directory of all the available telemedicine or telehealth doctors that you have in New York and Vermont. Um, just because we recognize that patients and members need care, and um, when there was stay-at-home orders, it was hard to go to the doctor, and maybe you didn't feel safe. So we we rolled this out as a as a way to help guide members into um, into the right way to receive care when they're locked at home. Starting with the bullets, um, we've been providing telemedicine visits for a few years now. Um, and in addition to uh, providing telemedicine, we've also rolled out a new service called My ER Now. That's like a triage service where you can call our My ER Now app and uh, they will they'll direct your care to either, um, maybe you do have to go to the ER, maybe the right answer is you have a telemedicine visit, maybe the correct answer is that you go to urgent care or you just go to your local pharmacy and pick up some sort of Advil or, uh, or Tylenol. We're also waiving cost share for our telemedicine, our My ER, out, My ER Now app. Um, and we're also promoting prescription refills to go from 30 day supplies to 90 day supplies. So you don't have to go into the pharmacy as frequently as you normally would. Um, in addition, there's also been changes to our uh, medical management policies which are making it easier for um, to go through medical review or there is no medical review for a few months or was no medical review for a few months so that you could have the care that you needed as quickly as possible. Uh, we've also notified our Vermont members of uh, the available state programs in case they do have financial needs and they, they can't um, afford their premiums in the commercial space. So that's another way that we're helping, uh, helping promote and helping our members navigate through the coronavirus. Great, thank you. Uh, next, I want to ask you about uh, coverage for COVID testing. Okay. Just give me a second. <clears throat> so, does MVP in this 2021 rate filing include COVID, COVID testing costs in our? Uh, analysis we are not so would you go to exhibit d please 
exhibit D is in dog. Okay. And you see that's an emergency rule. If you look at the top, emergency rule H 2020-03E from DFR regarding coverage of COVID-19 diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Do you see that? Yes. And you're familiar with this document? Yes. I want to focus on COVID uh, testing. So if you would go down to Section 3A, Section 3 says coverage of COVID-19 diagnosis. Would you read the first sentence of 3A, please? When medically necessary or directed by the state or federal government, health insurers shall cover any COVID-19 testing performed by the Center for Disease Control, the Vermont Department of Health, or a laboratory, laboratory approved by CDC or VDH with no copayment, coinsurance, or deductible requirements for members. And uh, this is a two-page uh, document, correct? The uh, rule is two pages, correct? Correct. And that term medically necessary, is that defined in this rule? It is not. Okay, would you go to uh, section 3B and read the sentence? Health insurers shall cover provider office or urgent care visits in emergency services visits to determine whether COVID-19 testing is medically necessary with no copayment, coinsurance, or deductible requirements for members. So in a nutshell, what is 3B saying? It's saying that um, when COVID-19 testing is medically necessary, there will be no charge to members, whether it's copay, deductible, or coinsurance. Thank you very much. Now, Matt, would you turn to Exhibit E, please? Exhibit E. Okay, so this is a draft. I want to be clear. It says draft across the front of it, but uh, it's Insurance Bulletin 214, and it's entitled Medically Necessary COVID-19 Testing. Do you see that? Yes. And what's the date on it on the front? July 6, 2020. And again, this is just a draft, but would you read uh, the uh, first sentence? The purpose of this bulletin is to clarify when COVID-19 testing shall be covered without cost sharing under emergency rule H-2020-03-E. And that goes to this issue of what is medically necessary, correct? That's what the document's entitled? Correct. So if you would go to the third paragraph, says in the department's view medically necessary testing includes all testing and then it goes on from there correct correct um, and then would you please read the first bullet under that recommended testing for asymptomatic individuals without known or suspected SARS CoV-2 exposure for early identification in special settings and do you have a concern about this first bullet well, it's from a societal standpoint, I understand it because you, even if you're asymptomatic, I mean, you're showing no symptoms um, and you're entering into public, it's a good way to help spread the, spread the disease. Um, there's a good way to help prevent the disease from spreading. That said though, uh, from, a, from an actuarial soundness perspective, there is concern because um, this kind of opens up the door to testing uh, across the board under almost any scenario. So you were talking about uh, the term asymptomatic individual, correct? Correct. And looking at this draft, I know it's just a draft, but that's not defined anywhere, is it? No, it's not. Okay. And the, the bullet ends with early identification in, and it says special settings. Do you see that? Yes. And do you have a concern about the term special settings? Yeah, um, it's broad, um, and I, I can use an example. We do have an employer group that is a school um, that's in New York and has uh, faculty and students in Vermont. And they recently informed us that um, they're going to do very rigorous regular testing uh, to help manage the spread of the virus throughout the school year. And they're estimating that they're going to do some 20,000 tests over the course of the school year um, with costs 
it's it's not it's not finalized yet. But regardless, even at twenty thousand at twenty thousand tests, uh, the cost could be substantial very quickly. So that would be like an occupational setting. Do you know if that would fall under this definition of special setting? Um, it's not defined what a special setting is, so I would assume that it would fall under a special setting. But you don't know because it's not defined, is it? No. And are you concerned about these costs uh, and uh, actually figuring out the amount that would rise to an actuarial level of reasonableness so you could include it in the rate file? Uh, yeah, there's definitely concern on our part. It's a, it's a big unknown. Um, what we're hoping is, as we talked about earlier, that there's a vaccine widely available in early 2021 that would mitigate uh, the need for testing on a regular basis, especially by asymptomatic individuals. Um, but if the vaccine isn't approved for quite some time into 2021, we assume that there is going to be rigorous and, high, and a high volume of testing that's going to occur until that time. And some of that could be this occupational testing, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. Let's now talk about LNE's position on COVID. If you'd go back to Exhibit 10, which is LNE's actuarial memorandum. So exhibit 10, page 9. OK. So on page nine, you see a number four heading. It's about four paragraphs down. It says changes to population morbidity adjustments. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is the section in LNE's report on COVID, correct? Correct. So uh, as I understand it, pages nine and 10, nine into 10, provides a summary of MVP's positions on COVID and assumptions, correct? Correct. And if you would please go to the third paragraph under that number four heading, <laughs> that third paragraph starts with as a result. Let me know when you're there. Okay. And in this paragraph, there's the second sentence makes reference to MVP relying on a Society of Actuaries research group. Do you see that? Yes. So uh, we relied on data from the Society of Actuaries, correct? Correct. And did LNE have any objection to that reliance? They did not. In fact, uh, aren't Mr. Dillon and Ms. Lee, aren't they members of the Society? Yes. And then the last sentence makes reference to based on information from the company's medical management team, and it goes on from there. Do you see that? Yes. And did l &E object in any way with uh, the actuaries at MVP relying on the medical management team providing them information? They did not. Okay, so at the top of page 10, Uh, the first couple paragraphs are MVP considering various utilization scenarios. Is that right? Yes. And Ellen is just summarizing that, correct? Correct. And then if you get to the uh, sentence where it says Ellen E, Ellen E does not believe, about five paragraphs down, do you see that? Yes. This is where we start to talk about, uh, or they start to talk about our capacity disagreements, correct? Correct. Now, is can you read that sentence, please? The L and E does not believe sentence. Providers have had an opportunity to receive oh, financial. Matt, I'm sorry, Matt. I'm sorry. Can you read the sentence above that, please? Oh. L and E does not believe that the assumption that providers will run at 110 percent capacity is adequately supported based on the following. Uh, and then there's three bullets underneath regarding L and E's assumptions. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, I understand you have two problems with their assumptions. Is that right? Two problems? Yes. 
So would you please read the first bullet? First bullet reads, providers have had an opportunity to receive financial assistance from the government to alleviate financial hardship, which reduces the financial incentive to run at greater than 100% capacity in the future. And do you disagree with this first bullet? I do disagree with that. And why? Um, it's, it's looking at this uh, need to fill or, or to have these procedures performed as purely a financial item, but it's not. It's providers and hospitals, they want to provide care. That's why they enrolled in the profession of being a doctor. They want to help people. Um, and there's people that needed to have a service performed or surgery performed that couldn't have it done in a, for the few months of uh, March, April, May. And so this, this assumption is disregarding that providers want to actually help people and to, to actually get their backlog of, of required procedures worked through, they need to increase capacity. Additionally, um, I, I'm not privy to these conversations, but uh, based on conversations I've had with our contracting team, we are not hearing that the provider community feels that they've been uh, fully compensated back for uh, canceled or reduced procedures in those few months. So on both fronts, I disagree with that bullet point. So, uh, and when you talked about, well, it's a, it's, I think you were talking about a desire to promptly treat patients. That's what healthcare providers have, correct? Correct. And that's not just your your opinion. That's based on information that your team has heard from uh, medical care providers. Is that right? Yes. And is it fair to say uh, you talked about the financial piece that they do want to generate uh, as much revenue as they can in 2020? Yeah, they would like. You know, they set a budget at the beginning of 2020, and I assume that they are trying to meet that budget revenue expectation. And uh, as, have you heard from anybody in MVP that medical care providers intend to sit back and live on government assistance? I have not. So this is the first problem that you identified with the assumption, correct? Correct. Uh, let's uh, go to the second and third bullet. Would you read the second bullet, please? There is an immense uncertainty regarding how long social distancing, cleaning, and other safety guidelines will continue into 2021, which limits provider capacity. Okay, and would you read the third bullet, please? Vermont had a quicker than average turnaround from shelter to in place, shelter in place to reopening, which potentially sets the stage for all deferred care to be recouped in 2020. Okay. And uh, is your second problem relate to these two bullets and what's being said there? Yes. Could you please describe to the board what your issue is? The second bullet um, discusses how much uncertainty there is regarding how long all of our social distancing and increased cleaning and other safety guidelines will continue. So there's uncertainty about, about all of this. But then the third bullet is stating that because Vermont is at a quicker turnaround on uh, shelter in place reopening, that Vermont providers will be able to provide as many services needed in calendar year 2020 to recoup um, all their deferred care. So one is an uncertainty where they're saying, we don't know how long this is going to go on. The other is acceleration and get it all completed in 2020. Well, to be clear, the second bullet says immense uncertainty, doesn't it? It does. And then in the third bullet, Melanie is going on to make their own assumptions, correct? Correct. Getting some feedback. Yeah. Some people could go on mute. Could everyone please check their mics. Make sure they're muted. Great. Is that better, Gary? Much better, thank you. Step. Matt, did you hear me? Yep, I think so. Would you, please, would you please read the sentence that starts, Eleni recommends under the three bullets? Eleni recommends that the adjustment for COVID-19 pent up be, demand be reduced to 0.0%. 
So is l &E recommending that we do nothing with our rates as it relates to COVID next year? They're recommending that when regards to pent up demand that we do nothing to our rates for it. And do you disagree with that and their rationale based on the two reasons we just discussed? Yes. And in considering capacity and pent up demand, is MDP actually attributing a number to it? Yes, 110%. So MVP has stepped up and measured the risk, correct? Correct. So let's go back to exhibit 10 and I want to talk about Eleni's views on vaccines, please. <clears throat> so on page 10 where we were at the very bottom, Eleni, the very last paragraph starts talking about their views on the vaccine, correct? Correct. And that goes on into page 11, correct? Correct. And as I understand it, they don't dispute any of our assumptions uh, regarding uh, timing of availability of the vaccine, correct? Correct. Or the vaccine cost of $75. They don't dispute that, correct? That's correct. Dispute is where we say there'll be an 80% vaccination rate and they say it'll be 55%. Is that right? That's right. Let's go to that sentence, please. It's the uh, third full paragraph. Would you please read that first sentence? Eleni recommends a vaccination rate assumption of 55% consistent with flu vaccination rates. So that's consistent with flu vaccination rates. That's how they came up with a number? Yes. And why do you believe, actually, I guess we've talked about that already, why you believe that's wrong, correct? I think we touched on it, but essentially um, the flu, while it is, it can be bad, it hasn't caused uh, the entire world to alter the way it approaches its day-to-day -day life and um, staying at home, quarantining, so on and so forth. And we expect a much higher vaccination rate for uh, COVID than we do for the flu. But we aren't assuming the max. As I mentioned earlier, for measles, mumps, rubella, we see a higher vaccination rate than 90%. So we're kind of in the balance of the two. We're in the middle, somewhere in the middle. So the next sentence in that paragraph references reducing the rate increase from 1 to 0.7. Do you see that? Yes. So is that, as to the vaccine issue, is uh, l &E disagreeing with us, and that disagreement amounts to 0.3 on the rate? The vaccine is approximately 0.3, and so is pent-up demand. They're both about okay. So it, it's vaccine issues, half of our dispute this year, basically, right? Yes. And the other half is the pent-up demand, correct? Correct. I'm Here, Officer in. Barber, are you, I saw you hold your hand up. Yeah, I just, we're getting some uh, road noise or, or something. Um, again, could everyone just check their, their mics to make sure they're muted? Um, except for Mr. Yeah, Carnegie. Someone in the Burlington area because the jets are flying. That's what it uh, sounds. It's, if you can hear me, it's the court reporter. It's me, and I'm having trouble with my mute. Um, I don't know if Abigail or Christine, whoever set this up, if you can move, mute me on your end, that would help. Yes, I, I can mute you, Joanne. This is Christina. I'm nervous that if I mute you, you may not be, be able to unmute you. Um, I, can, I can text you quickly if I have trouble. So I'll text you, but um, okay. I don't. I don't know what's going on with mute today, but it's in charge. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, it looks like she's muted you, uh, and I don't hear any noise. So, <laughs> Mr. Carnegie, proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt, next I want to talk about medical trend assumptions. It appears we have agreement with L&E, but let's go through that. If you would please go to Stay at Exhibit 10 and go to page 6 of the exhibit, please. Okay. Uh, if you look, there's a item 3 trend from 20 to 21 in the middle of the page. Do you see that? Yes. So this is where their discussion of the trend starts. Um, I want to go to page 7 please, and you'll see a heading at the top, medical unit cost trend. Do you see that? 
Yes. So I want to focus on the medical trend. Uh, if you would please read the first sentence of the paragraph underneath medical unit cost trend. MVP computed its allowed trend as a weighted average of the medical claim unit cost trends in 2020 and 2021 for inpatient, outpatient, and physician claims based on known and assumed price increases for MVP's provider network. Read the next sentence. This approach is consistent with prior rate filings. And then go to the second paragraph and read the first two sentences, please. Since the 2021 hospital budget review is not yet finalized, MVP has assumed that hospital increases will match the 2020 increases with a few exceptions by facility. These expected assumptions for hospital budget increases are based on information from MVP's contracting department. And then would you please read the text in the box to the right there? Yep. The header is GMCB hospital budget review. It says the overall unit cost medical trend of 6.0% includes one, a trend of 6.2% for facilities and providers that are impacted by the GMCB's hospital budget review, and two, a trend of 5.5% for all for other medical facilities and providers that are not subject to the hospital budget review. And, and would you read the sentence below uh, the box to the left, please? l &E believes the assumed unit cost trends are reasonable and appropriate. Okay, so we have agreement on that, correct? Yes. Uh, next, I would ask you. To go to page eight, please. Okay. And uh, as I understand it, the second paragraph involves l &E summarizing some independent trend calculations that they did? Yes. Okay. And then if you could read the third paragraph that starts based on. Based on the above analyses, l &E considers the assumed utilization trend of 1% to be reasonable and appropriate. Okay, so we have agreement on that, correct? Correct. And then uh, would you please read the first sentence under total allowed medical trend? Based on the information available, l &E considers the total allowed medical trend of 7.0% to be reasonable and appropriate. Okay, so we have agreement on that, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and then in the next paragraph, it's the fifth paragraph uh, on the page. Uh, would you please read the last two sentences of that paragraph, starting with due to? <laughs> Due to the disruptions from COVID-19, it appears likely the submitted hospital budget request will be higher than last year. If this is the case, it may mean that a higher premium increase is necessary. And do you agree with that? Yes, my understanding is there's an additional item included in the proposed hospital budgets to account for uh, COVID, one-time adjustment for COVID loss revenue. And uh, would you please describe to the board if they're familiar with the challenge of the timing of the hospital budget process and uh, also talk about what uh, the board is having us do differently this year in terms of briefing that issue? Sure. So every year there's a little bit of a timeline issue um, where our rates are submitted in May and approved in early August. And the proposed hospital budgets come in during that review period, and then the final approval is after rates are approved. Um, this year, due to the pandemic, there's a little bit of a push. The, the proposed hospital budget timeline is pushed out a little further, um, but it is before the approval of our rates will, be, will happen. So um, the board is allowing carriers to provide a little uh, memorandum summarizing the impact of the proposed hospital budgets on our rates. I'd like to talk about uh, the risk adjustment where I believe there's agreement. If you would go to bullet number four, please, it's on page 16. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's the reference to the updated risk adjustment. I'm sorry, I want to bring you right to it. We agreed to uh, a reduction of approximately, was it 1.1 or 1.2? On, on I, don't, 
We agreed with L&E's calculation, um, and that was 1.1%. Okay. So I apologize. I took you to the wrong page. So go to page 10, please. Excuse me, page 13. That's the last mistake I'll ever make. Page 13. There it is. Finally. So on page 13, you see an item 10 changes to risk adjustment. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So would you explain to the board uh, the information that we relied on and the information that L&E relied on and then recent information that's come in on risk adjustment? Yep. Yeah, so uh, earlier we I talked about how um, we have to include risk adjustment to level the playing field between the carriers to remove the impact of morbidity differences in our populations. Um, when we set our rates in May, the only information that we have is CMS's interim results. Uh, that's what MVP included in its proposed rates. After after our rates are submitted shortly after that, we have final files from CMS's edge server that we share with l &E, as well as Blue Cross, and they compute what the risk transfer amounts will be uh, so that we can discuss that during the rate review process. We received our actual risk adjustment results from CMS this past Friday, um, and on over $20 million of a payment, um, l &E's calculation was within $160, so no material difference in the two calculations. And we agree that we should be putting in the actual CMS results into our rates to normalize our claims for the market-wide risk. So we have agreement on that up to these most recent numbers, correct? Correct. And I, I did say it was 1.1% before. Um, I know that in this file, there's that table on, I believe, page 16 that shows 1.2 down to 0.1, which would show 1.1, and then they reference 1.2. I'd like to clarify that I don't know the exact number, but I just agree that we should be putting in the actual CMS final results, and whatever that impact is, it's 1.1 or 1.2 percent, and we Thank agree you. with the money. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, now I want to talk briefly about administrative costs. If you go to Exhibit 1, please, which is our original rate filing. Exhibit 1, and then go to page 119. <coughs> Okay. And do you see the fifth paragraph down says general administrative expense load, including QI component? Do you see that heading? Yes. I'm just waiting to make sure the board is caught up. Okay. And in the first sentence, there's a reference to, uh, there's a number and a reference to PMPM. PM. Can you tell the board what that is? Yep, so um, PMPM represents per member per month. Um, we take total claim dollars to buy by our member months that we have available to us to compute a PMPM. So that normalizes out for uh, differences in membership. And we are proposing to charge $43.75 per member per month um, for administrative expenses. 49 cents of that charge is because um, due to the pandemic, we're rolling out credit card payments to small employers. Previously, only individuals could pay via credit card. We had an uptake rate of around 20% for individuals. Um, we're assuming a 10% small employer group uptake rate, which will increase the admin load by 49 cents because we do have to pay 2.8% um, credit card fee. Okay, thank you. So the, the PMPM PM for this year, our administrative expense load, in our original filings, 43.75 p.m. p.m., correct? Correct. And let's see what L&E says about that. If you would please go to back to Exhibit 10 and go to page 14. We're talking about administrative costs, so you'll see heading 13, changes in administrative costs. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. So there's a discussion about administrative costs, and then uh, if you would go to page 15. Would you read the first full paragraph, please? 
The administrative costs assumed in the 2021 filing are consistent with MVP's recent individual and small group administrative costs as reported in the last three years of the company's supplemental healthcare exhibit. The company's expenses have decreased since 2013 when they were $46.57 PMPM. Okay, so that $46.57 compares to this year, which for 2021, which is $43.75, correct? Correct. And uh, just generally, what is Eleni talking about in the next paragraph, the, the second full paragraph on page 15? Um, they're, they're referencing our growth in the Vermont market, but our contraction in the New York market and overall how that's impacting uh, administrative costs, because a lot of our costs are fixed and spread out across both states. And would you read the last sentence of that paragraph, please? Considering the reduced administrative costs over the recent years, l &E considers the assumed 2021 administrative costs to be reasonable and appropriate. <clears throat> okay, so Matt, in summary of your opinion, if MVP adopts the recommendations we've identified, the l &E recommendations, and the resulting change from 7.34 goes to 6.06, .06, is that rate 6.06 .06, actually sound and reasonable. Yes. And I want to talk about reserves and solvency. Uh, this year, MVP has a, a CTR proposal of 1.5%, correct? Correct. So if you would go to Exhibit 11, I want to see what DFR says about that. Let me know when you're there. Exhibit 11. I'm there. So this Exhibit 11 is DFR's letter to Chair Mullen regarding uh, solvency this year for MVP, correct? Correct. And you've reviewed this and you're familiar with it? Yes. Okay. Would you turn to the second page and read the sentence under summary of opinion? The proposed rate filed by MVP HP would not negatively impact its solvency and the company otherwise meets Vermont's financial licensing requirements for a foreign insurer. And would you please read the third bullet under, <clears throat> uh, oh, excuse me, do you agree with that, what you just read? Yes. And would you please read the third bullet under MVP HP solvency? Finally, in 2019, all of MVP holding companies operations in Vermont accounted for approximately 5.7% of its total premiums written. DFR has determined that MVP HP's Vermont operations pose little risk to its solvency. Nonetheless, adequacy of rates and contribution to surplus are necessary for all health insurers to maintain strength of capital that keeps pace with claim trends. And would you agree with that? Yes. And then would you read the sentence under impact of the filing on solvency, please? Based on the entity-wide assessment above and contingent upon GMCB actuaries finding that the proposed rate is not inadequate, DFR's opinion is that the proposed rate will not have a negative impact on MVPHP solvency. Great, so let's, let's see what l &E says about CTR. If you go to back to exhibit 10, and go to page 15, and it's item 15, so let me know when you're there. Okay. <clears throat> and you see in the second paragraph, there's a reference to a reasonableness check. Do you see that? Yes. What's that about, please? Um, small group and individual uh, QHP filings are available on the SASIA website. l &E reviewed three years of rate filings. Um, in 2020, there were 783 of them. In 2020, MVP's proposed CTR of 1.5% um, is almost 2% below the average CTR submitted, and it would rank 630th out of 783 filings, which is around the 20th percentile. Our CTR proposals in the last two years have also been in a similar percentile range, around the 20th percentile. So 80% of filings have a CTR that is higher than what MVP is proposing. In your opinion, did we pass the reasonableness check? 
Um, yes. Uh, would you please read the in the last paragraph? It's the first sentence. Eleni believes the CTR and bad debt assumptions are reasonable and appropriate. So Eleni agrees with us on the CTR, correct? Correct. Um, in your opinion, will the decrease from our original filing of 7.34 to 6.06, .06, which adopts all of the recommendations of Eleni except for COVID? adversely impact the solvency of MVP Healthcare Inc. It will not. Although our proposed rates uh, are reduced, our CTR remains at 1.5%, correct? Correct. Do you anticipate that contributions to reserves would require a change depending on the hospital budget? I'm talking about contributions to reserves. Our rate may need to change, but the CTR load of 1.5% would not change. So in the framework and context of contributions to reserves, could you tell the board about the interplay between vaccines next year and testing and how uh, that should be viewed in the context of the CTR? Yeah, CTR, um, it's, there's one, there's, um, minimum solvency requirements set forth by regulators and two the point of uh reserves is to be able to provide consumers with peace of mind in case there's adverse claim events um, the 1.5 percent in, in addition as claims increase which leads to premiums increasing that means that our uh our adverse risk the, the magnitude of it will increase that's why we need to continue to add to our reserve levels Costs in healthcare are very right tail skewed, meaning that there's a few people that incur most of the cost. And those right tail events are becoming more and more challenging to predict and could be more and more impactful as there's new breakthroughs in uh, pharmaceuticals and technological breakthroughs. Thank you. Uh, I wanna to touch on briefly the non-actuarial issues uh, that we uh, need to consider, the board needs to consider at the hearing. If you would please go to your pre-filed testimony, Exhibit 9A. And please go to page four of that document and let me know when you're there. I'm there. Can you give the board a minute to catch up? Okay, Matt, do you see that there's a, a Q16, why don't you read that please? What step, steps has MVP taken to lower costs and establish that its proposed rates promote affordability, access to care and quality of care for Vermonters? Okay, so those are the non-actuarial issues, correct? Correct. Okay, and in, in this response, there's a long list. How many items are listed there? Uh, 22 items. And then if you look at the list, uh, some or many of those items have a cross reference to an ad additional Q&A, correct? Correct. And those uh, additional Q&As drill down on the issue, is that fair? That's fair. So with these items uh, in your pre-filed uh, relating to non-actuarial issues, uh, evidence some of MVP's steps to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish that the rates proposed are affordable to Vermonters. Correct. Matt, uh, would you go back to Exhibit 1? This will be brief. It's our original filing. And go to page 112 of the exhibit. Okay. So exhibit one, page 112. And you see um, there's a heading for market slash benefits. Do you see that? Yes. And do you see uh, the fifth paragraph down, there's a reference to a wellness benefit. Do you see that? Yes. Could you tell the board 
about the wellness benefits, please. So um, standard plans and non-standard plans are offered in this market. Standard plans mean that all the carriers, so the two carriers in, in Vermont Merge Market, offer the same set of benefits to provide an apples to apples shopping experience for consumers. Non-standard plans have to remain metal level compliant, but they provide carriers with the ability to uh, differentiate themselves in some way. And a way that we're differentiating ourselves is through a wellness benefit, which can provide up to $600 of reimbursement for subscribers um, that take personal health assessments, um, live an active lifestyle, uh, things such as that. Matt, on a non-actuarial issue, would you agree that how MVP manages its administrative costs makes its insurance more affordable? Yes. As and will MVP take steps to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish that, that the rates proposed are affordable to Vermonters? Yes. Uh, do you have an opinion on whether short-term, quote, affordable, end quote, underpricing will make insurance affordable in the long run? Uh, my opinion is it will not. Well, Matt, each year we need to walk through the statutory criteria. I'm going to do that with you uh, quickly, and we're just about done, okay? Um, so I want to frame these questions around the 6.06, .06, which is the revised rate, all right? The, the rate that we're proposing now is 6.06. .06. Are you with me? Yes. So each of these questions relate to the 6.06 .06 rate, okay? Okay. Do the MVP rates meet the standard of affordability based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? Yes. Do the rates promote quality of care and access to health care based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? Yes. Is this rate filing unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law based on the rate filing, other evidence submitted, and your testimony today? It is not. Are the rates reasonable based on the data that we have? Yes. Are the rates actuarially sound and fairly charged premium for services covered? Yes. Are the rates excessive, <laughs> inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? They are not. Are the rates reasonable relative to the benefits that are offered? Yes. Do they provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, and regulatory fees and have reasonable contingency and or profit margin? Yes. So they are adequate? Yes. Do the rates exceed the rate needed to provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and reasonable contingency and or profit margin? They do not. So they're not excessive? That's correct. They're not excessive. Do the rates result in premium differences among insureds within similar risk categories, which are not permissible under applicable law and do not reasonably correspond to differences in, expect, in expected costs? Can you re-ask that question and cut out for a second? I'm sorry. Sure. It's also the triple negatives, right? It gets kind of yep. confused. Do the rates result in premium differences among insureds within similar risk categories, which are not permissible under applicable law and do not reasonably correspond to differences in expected costs. Uh, they're in compliance with the law. So they're not unfairly discriminatory? That's correct. So Matt, there's one last issue I wanted to touch on. Attorney uh, Angoff uh, referenced it in his opening, and that is this question around uh, return of premium. So this relates to 2020, uh, not to your rate filing, but I wanted to touch on it and have the board hear MVP's view on any anticipated return of premium in 2020. Okay. So go ahead, tell them your view. Uh, it's too early to tell is, is generally MVP's perspective. As I mentioned a few times, um, we did experience reduced claims for a few months, but in June, our paid level is back to where they were in January and February, pre-COVID levels. Um, there's also concern about the long-term implications of deferring care that could lead members to being in a higher morbidity state. 
as time plays on, we're going to keep reviewing the situation and monitor uh, both those items, paid volume as well as uh, member health, if we're seeing an escalation in morbidity. Um, until that time, uh, it's too early to assess the situation of how 2020 will play out. And uh, Matt, would you please go to Exhibit G, which is in evidence? Okay. So uh, I'm just going to identify it and have you confirm. This is uh, a July 7th, 2020 letter to Chair Mullen. Uh, you can see that on page one, correct? Correct. And this this is uh, relates to Blue Cross Blue Shield's uh, solvency opinion from the DFR for this year's filing, correct? That's correct. And then uh, on the last page, it's a three-page exhibit. It just show the signature of Commissioner Pichak, correct? That's correct. And everything is redacted in the letter with the exception of two paragraphs that talk about this issue about the return of premium, correct? Correct. So these are the only two paragraphs that you're familiar with in the letter, correct? That's correct. So what is uh, what is uh, the commissioner saying about this issue? So from the first paragraph, the question being asked is, have Vermonters overpaid for their health insurance in 2020? And the second paragraph addresses that and says, due to the current uncertainty around COVID-19, it is too early to answer this question with confidence regarding health insurance. Simply put, some effects of COVID-19 are clearly positive in the short term for company solvency, while some of the longer term effects are likely negative. The scope of these effects cannot be known at this time. So generally, does the commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation agree with us that the premium return decision is, too, is premature? Yes. So Matt, just a couple of closing questions. Uh, the big issue we believe in the rate filing this year is the COVID impact, correct? Correct. And there's some uncertainty about this impact on rates in 2021, correct? Correct. But in your opinion, is MVP reasonably assess that uncertainty based on available data? Yes. In your opinion, uh, you've also relied on the professional opinions of, of the actuaries at MVP, like yourself, correct? That's correct. That is what actuaries are required to do, measure uncertainty, correct? Correct. And then would you agree with me that the statutory criteria that we just went through are interrelated? Yes. They're not siloed, are they? They're not. And any adjustments to a rate increase, for whatever reason, all feed into a final number, correct? Correct important that that final number is actuarially sound and reasonable, correct? Correct. And in this case, you believe that number is 6.06%, correct? That's correct. If the board cuts the final number on non-actuarial grounds, is there a risk that the rate could be no longer adequate? Yes. In contrast, based on your testimony and the other evidence that we've uh, put in today, is the insurance product we uh, provide affordable within the 6.06 .06 increase and meet all the statutory criteria, in your opinion? Yes. That's all the questions I have for Matt at this time. Okay, I think this is a good point to take a short break before we get into cross. Um, so, why don't we reconvene at 1010? We're doing okay on time. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. It's 1010. Um, before we go back on the record, I just want to text the court reporter and make sure she's back at her computer. Yes, I'm, I'm back. Oh, great. Thought you might have been muted. Okay. So we are back on record in uh, the matter of docket number GMCB 00620RR in VPHP's 2021 individual and small group rate filing. Uh, Mr. Connerty just finished the direct examination of Matt Lombardo. And so now 
Mr. Angoff, do you have cross-exam questions for this witness? Good morning, Mr. Lombard. Good morning, Mr. Angoff. I hope you're doing well. And I, you. I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about the relationship between 2020 and 2021. I think you said uh, in the middle of your testimony that it would be actuarially unsound to reduce rates in 2021 based on MVPs having paid out less in 2020 than it projected. Is that correct? It's correct. Our rates are set so that the premiums that we're charging will cover our expected claim costs in calendar year 2021. Okay. And I was a little unclear as to what your view was if it should turn out that 2020, that in 2020, MVP pays out less, let's assume substantially less than it assumed in its rate filing filed in 2019. Are, are you saying, are there any conditions under which you believe that a refund of 2020 premium would be appropriate? At this time, it's it's too early to tell. Um, we're just we're monitoring the situation, and that's a decision that would not be made by me as the actuary. My job is to produce an actuarially sound rate and project what 2021 will look like, and that's what we're doing in our rate filing. Okay, so you so you, you're it's not your decision. Well, it's it's the board's decision, but you can envision a situation, can't you? Uh, under which MVP, when all the data are in, MVP will have paid out substantially less than it projected it would pay out in 2020, correct? It's it's still too early to tell. We only have data paid through June. Um, and we did, you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, we did see a suppression of claims um, in March, April, and May. But June is back to pre-COVID levels. In January and February, actually ran very unfavorably for us uh, across our enterprise. So it's, if we look at the whole year, it's it's something that's unknown at this time. Okay. Um, then talking regarding paid claims through June 19, uh, 19, through June 2020, could you please take a look at exhibit one and turn to page 113? Okay. Okay, and you see the, um, the chart there at the bottom? Yes. Okay, and that shows paid and incurred claims um, between uh, January 2019 and December 2019, correct? That's correct. Okay, just very briefly, uh, the uh, difference between the paid claims and incurred claims is pretty nominal, but could you explain why there is that difference yeah, there's there can be a lag, and when a claim is when a claim is paid relative to when it's incurred. Um, so, for example, if I were to go to the doctor today uh, for a visit, that claim may not be paid out until August, September, October, November in a future month. So, if we were looking at it, that visit that I had would show up in the incurred line of if there was a July 2020. It would be in that line, but it would not be in the paid line. Okay. Um, could you tell the board and me where your data is for paid and incurred data to the extent it exists for 2020 by month? It's not in this table because we're using 2019 data normalized for risk adjustment to set our rates. Okay. Um, didn't L and E ask you for that data? I'd have to go back into the interrogatories and look. Um, well, can you point me to any uh, any place in your rate filing where 2020 paid data by month appears? Off the top of my head, I would have to go through all the exhibits to see exactly where that information is included, if it is included. Well, please do.
And Mr. Lombardo, so we can shortcut this, if you should come to the conclusion that L&E did not ask you for that data, please say so. It's going to take me some time. I do not see it in the exhibits that I've reviewed. Okay. So uh, you're reasonably certain then that L&E did not ask you for the monthly paid data in 2020, correct? Well, there's hundreds of pages. I haven't read through them all thoroughly. I don't recall that being requested throughout the review process. Um, I wouldn't say that with 100% certainty, but based on my brief review and my recollection, I do not see that information. That's fine. Um, can you tell us now uh, approximately how much MVP did pay out month by month? Or if you don't have it month by month um, for the total first half of 2020? I don't have that information at my fingertips. That's not readily available. Um, as I mentioned, January and February came in worse than expected. March, April, and May were suppressed due to COVID, and June is returning to more normalized levels. Okay, so are March, April, and May, were they suppressed by 20%? Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head to, to speak to that exactly. Well, could it have been more than 20%? It could have been less, it could have been more. Okay, rather than playing 20 questions, will you please submit for the board even though LNE did not ask for it, would you please submit for the board's consideration your paid claims data to the extent it's available by month for 2020? I'm going to object. I don't think the purpose of cross-examination is to ask the witness to be submitting exhibits. Well, this, this could not be more relevant to what the board has in front of it. And I assume that based on their expertise, l &E would have asked for the monthly paid claims data for 2020. If they have not, I think it's, it's, it's really pretty important for the board to consider that data. I'm going to further object on the ground that uh, l and &E had an opportunity to submit interrogatories to the board to forward to MVP. They could have asked then. They didn't. This is a tight administrative process with tight deadlines, and I think it's inappropriate, and I object. So I, th I think the question is a fair one, whether MVP would submit that data. Um, so I would ask the witness to answer. And then if we need to have a dispute about authority to compel, we can do that. So could you please answer the question, Mr. Lombardo? We have the data. Um, if it's required to provide it, we could provide it. It is. But it's important to, rec to remember that uh, 2020 is not completed. There is no risk adjustment baked in. 2020 is not part of the rate setting process for 2021 to produce an actuarially sound rate. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lombardo, you talked quite a bit about the costs that MVP would incur based on your estimates in connection with um, a coronavirus vaccine, correct? Yes. Okay. And you hope, and boy, I sure hope you're right. You, you hope that a vaccine would be available in 2021 and you are uh, including in the rate filing an amount based on a vaccine being available in 2021, correct? Yes, that's correct. Oh, 
Okay, and I'm sure everybody here uh, totally agrees with your hope that that will be the case, but we don't know that that'll be the case, correct? It is not fully known at the time. If it were known, it would be approved already. It's all of our hopes. It's an assumption, and yes, it's, it's a hope. Okay. But you are charging your policyholders based on a hope, correct? Um, it's based on data that's available to us, uh, whether it's federal government funding, FDA accelerated process of, of expediting the approval, uh, the fact that the science community is almost fully focused on this, it seems. It's based on all of that data. It's not just something that's pulled out of the air. Okay, and not to be a doomsayer, but you've also heard people say, haven't you? And man, I hope they are wrong that there's not going to be a vaccine for four years, that it's that it, it's that, that that would be fast. I mean, you've heard those statements, right? I've I've heard people reference the normal approval timeline of a vaccine is usually somewhere in the multiple year range. Um, but I know this is a different situation. Well, I hope you're right. Uh, Me too. You also assume that the cost of this vaccine would be paid by MVP and it would be $75, uh, $75 a shot, right? Yes. Okay, but we don't know, do we, assuming that there is a vaccine, whether or not the government will pay for it, do we? That's not known. Um, I haven't seen anything come across my my email that has suggested that that's going to be the case. I have not seen anything re regarding that. Okay. But you assume the $75 cost that would be paid by MVP, correct? Yes. Okay. And then you also assume that 80% of the 80% uh, of the population would get the vaccine, right? That's correct. Okay. And again, I hope you're right, but You've heard about the anti-vaxxers, right? Yes. Okay. And I know there's not much of an African-American community in Vermont, but have you heard that among the, in the African-American community, there's a substantial skepticism about a coronavirus vaccine? I have not heard that. Okay. Um, but, but once again, none of us know what percentage of people will take up the vaccine, assuming that there is a vaccine, correct? We do not know the exact percentage, but the fact that a vaccination like MMR, measles, mumps, rubella is higher than what we're assuming, um, that would suggest to me that the anti-vaxxer community is less than that percentage, whatever the MMR uptake rate is. Well, Again, I hope you're right. Remember, we you talked previously a little bit about your administrative costs. Correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. And MVP has had very substantial growth in Vermont in the past several years, hasn't it? Yes. Okay. And all things equal, when a company has growth in uh, in its business, growth in its, num growth in its number of policies, growth in its premium, its administrative per, uh, costs per member per month should go down, shouldn't they? Uh, in Enterprise-wide, we have not experienced growth in membership. In Vermont, we have, but the decreases in New York have more than offset it for a decrease overall in our membership. And there's a lot of costs that are shared amongst both states, and they have to be spread across both states. I'll use our claims operating system or our license with Microsoft, that's not specific to Vermont. That is something that's spread out regardless of how many members we have across both states. So that items such as that, they have to be weighed across the entire enterprise. Okay, so you're saying Vermont policyholders, despite the fact that Vermont business of MVP has grown will be paying your enterprise-wide administrative costs 
which include the New York business that has decreased, correct? Yeah, Vermont is part of our enterprise. Vermont members are part of our enterprise, so are New York members. So yes, everybody, it is, it is a shared cost. Do you see any practical way of separating out any of those costs so that Vermont policyholders don't pay for your entire enterprise costs? Not the ones that are shared um, across both states. If it's something that's specific to Vermont, then yes, that is something that could decrease as time goes on. But if it's if it's a shared cost, such as, like I said, our claims operating system or a Microsoft license, that's not something, unless we have overall increase in our membership enterprise wide, at that point, we could decrease our PMPM. And if we can decrease our PMPM, we can offer an even more affordable rate and a more competitive rate and try to gain more market share. It is our goal to work towards efficiencies uh, and, and reduce costs because that flows into our premium rate and our competitive position. Okay, so do you see any practical way without uh, unfairly affecting your enterprise-wide costs of reducing Vermonters, uh, the, the amount that Vermonters pay for administrative costs? Uh, off the top of my head, I mean, it, it's just a matter of how our variable costs and how quickly we can adapt to our variable costs. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't have a specific item that I can speak to, but again, to the extent that we can offer a more competitive administrative fee, then that will help make our rate more affordable and more competitive. Um, what was the uh, trend assumption you used in this current filing, the total trend assumption? I believe it was 7%. I'd have to refer back, but it, I believe it was 7%. Okay. And what was your trend assumption last year? What was your trend assumption in the the, the uh, 2019 filing for 2020 rates? I don't have that in front of me, so I couldn't speak to that. But our trend assumptions reflect the expected change in our costs from uh, the base period of 2019 into 2021. That's based on known increases as well as uh, conversations that we've had with some of our provider partners and assumed increases, which are generally set equal to, in the for the Green Mountain Care Board Control Hospital budget items, they're generally set equal to the prior year rate increase, with the exception if, if we've had a conversation with a facility or provider group that's indicating otherwise. Okay. And that is something, we do have a strong preference that the trends reflect in our rates are well aligned with the approved hospital budgets. So to the extent that information becomes available, that is our preference. Even if, if that results in a decrease of the trend, then we accept that. That would still produce an actually sound rate. Our concern is if trend is higher than we're anticipating and an adjustment isn't made, that would produce an actually unsound rate. Did Eleni ask you what your trend was for 2020? Well, part of our rate filing has so our 2020 rate filing uses 2018 base experience and has a 2019 trend component and a 2020 trend component. So the 2020 portion of our 2020 rate filing is included in our rate increase in this filing. Okay, um, I may have asked a bad question. Let me, let me uh, ask what I hope is a better question. Did Eleni ask you what trend assumption you included in the filing that you made in 2019 for your 2020 rates? They did not specifically ask that, but that is available. And uh, with that said, to produce an actually sound rate, what happened in that rate filing isn't relevant unless it's there's a, a significant disconnect between what actually the trend, the actual trend is in 2020 versus what we're building in to our rate. Okay. Well, whether it, whether or not it's relevant is something that the board will decide. But let me just ask you then, can you tell the board right now what your trend assumption was in your 2019 filing for 2020 rates? No. Okay. 
Um, your, in this filing, you assumed a utilization trend of 1%, correct? That's correct. Okay, and could you turn please to exhibit 10, which is the l &E report uh, and turn to page eight. Okay, I'm ready whenever you and the board members are. Okay, and uh, before asking you a, a question about, uh, about that page, let me ask you about volatility. In your rate filing, you said that the volatility of the uh, utilization trend has been too great to use for medical utilization trend purposes. What, could you tell me what that means and why that is? Yeah, um, as you referenced, we have grown our membership uh, in the Vermont individual and small group market. And with that, we have a population that's changing over time. And also with that, uh, if we only isolate the one portion of our experience that's been with us for the past two to three years, it's not a, it's not representative of what we actually are enrolling, what our population is enrolled in right now. Additionally, utilization trend is something that's more market centric than specific to the carrier. Um, so I know last year l &E took utilization data from MVP as well as Blue Cross. They did their own independent calculations and arrived at a trend, a reasonable trend assumption of, I believe they referenced one to 4% and we had 0% last year and they recommended that we increase it to 1%. That's what we're assuming in our rate filing for this year for similar reasons because of the volatility. I well recall Alanis recommendation that you increase your trend assumption last year. Could you read the first bullet on page eight? Okay, what, <laughs> sorry, what, what exhibit are we on? Uh, that's, exhibit, that's exhibit 10, the l &E letter of July 7, 2020. Thanks. The three-year annual utilization trend was approximately 0.0%. Okay, so do you believe that uh, the use of a 0% utilization trend in this current rate filing would be unreasonable? Based on the data that l &E analyzed, there were, there was, there's been re, uh, increases in recent times of trend those patterns continue 0% would be unreasonable. Um, using l &E's four years of data to produce a, the last bullet, a regression analysis using all four years of data produce a fitted utilization trend rate of approximately 1.2%. So we're, we're assuming 1%, which is below that figure. Okay, so, you, so your position is that a 0% utilization trend would be unreasonable. Based on l &E's analysis using the market-wide data, Yes, zero percent seems like it would be a little bit short. Um, in your rate filing, what did you assume regarding the number of coronavirus cases that would occur uh, each day in Vermont for the rest of the year? In 2020? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, you're referring to a specific assumption in our rate filing. Could you just provide a little bit more clarity, please? Sure. Obviously, you made, you made in formulating 2020, 21 rates and in determining uh, how the coronavirus would affect both how much we pay out for the coronavirus related claims and how much you would pay out for non-coronavirus related claims and deferred claims, you had to make some assumption, didn't you, as to how many coronavirus claims there would be in Vermont in 2020. So all I'm asking you is, what did you assume as to the number of coronavirus claims per day that would occur in Vermont in 2020? We didn't make any assumption about coronavirus claims per day in our rate filing. What we're looking at in our refiling is the impact of canceling services for two months and the impact that could have on pent-up demand that would flow into 2021 
That is not specifically coronavirus related claims. Um, but would you agree that the number of coronavirus claims that occur has a relationship to uh, the amount of non-coronavirus related claims that you would be responsible for? Um, I guess I'm not clear on that question. I'll answer the best I can, but we're assuming in 2021 that there will be a vaccine widely available in early 2021, which would prevent and mitigate the number of actual coronavirus claims that we would incur in 2021. Okay, so you, so you made no assumption as to the number of coronavirus claims that would occur in 2020 in formulating your rates for 2021. Is that correct? Our rates are assuming that 2021 will be a normal uh, pre-pandemic year. So the 2020, there is no adjustment for coronavirus specific claims that we had to make for that. We're, we're, we're assuming 2021 will be a normal year with a little bit of pent up demand for de deferred services and vaccination costs. I get you. And that, then so similarly, you're making no assumptions because in your, in your view, it's unnecessary to make such assumptions regarding the number of coronavirus related hospitalizations in 2020, correct? That, that doesn't have a bearing on our 2021 rates um, based on our data and our view of the world when we set our rates in May. Okay, and did you follow the same, uh, the, the same philosophy in formulating your New York rates? Uh, our New York rates assume the same COVID-19 assumptions, uh, which is pent up demand and vaccination costs. Um, could I ask you please to uh, turn to exhibit four? Okay. Okay. And Mr. Lombardo, you're, you're familiar, aren't you, with the litigation in which MVP is a plaintiff regarding the, uh, uh, the, the risk card or program? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar, aren't you, with the Supreme Court's decision in the industry's favor? regarding the risk card program mitigation, correct? That's correct. Okay, to what extent, if any, did you include the risk card or payments uh, that you will receive based on that litigation in the, this current filing? So short answer is we did not assume anything, but I think that is that requires you to understand what the risk corridor program or requires an explanation. The risk corridor program was rolled out in 2014, 2015, 2016, when the ACA rolled out. The risk corridor program's intention was because there was a lot of uncertainty about risk adjusting, what the individual market with these new rules would look like, small group would look like with these new rules, and it was a really challenging time to predict costs. So the risk corridor program was intended to help uh, mitigate gains and losses that would be that would occur because of that uncertainty. So the reason why we're due to receive this $1.785 million is because we had costs, therefore financial losses, that exceeded our expectations in that time period that the government told us they would reimburse us for and they did not. Okay, so so it's a, and it's not 100% of the losses recovered, it's just a portion of those losses will be recovered. Well, uh, agreed, but so am I correct in understanding that the total amount that MVP is to receive based on the risk Carter litigation is 1.7 million? Assuming that the Supreme Court decision uh, doesn't face any more barriers and things and payments are actually distributed, which is still unclear at this time, whether or not that's gonna happen, we would receive $1.785 million. Okay, and is, is that for 
enterprise-wide MVP or just for Vermont? This is Vermont specific. Okay, and you're not including any of that in the rate in, in this current rate file, correct? That's correct. Okay, and you said it's not clear what's going to happen despite the fact that there's been a Supreme Court decision saying that you all won, correct? That's correct. Okay, well, there's no appeal from the Supreme Court decision, is there? That's my understanding. Okay, and then you say, or your counsel says in this, uh, on uh, page three of this exhibit, could you please read the, uh, the uh, second sentence beginning on the fourth line in complex litigation, beginning with in complex litigations? Yep, in complex litigation such as this, it typically takes a great deal of time to work through a number of procedural and process issues, and it is likely there will be no resolution of the risk corridor litiga litigation in the foreseeable future, much less when or if payments will be made to health insurers. Much less when or if payments will be made to health insurers. Mr. Lombardo, would you agree with me that, to put it kindly, that statement is a little bit of an overreach? I object to the extent that he's asking the witness to talk about litigation and legal issues it's beyond the scope of this witness's expertise um i'll draw the question okay. mr lombardo if the uh proposed increase by mvp this year were approved to what extent would that affect uh MVP's RBC ratio. So with the adjustment from 7.34% down to 6.06%, uh, our overall enterprise-wide RBC would not be negatively impacted. Okay. And if the board were to order no increase this year, to what extent would that affect MVP's RBC ratio? It would have a negative effect on it. Um, it, it certainly would. The, the magnitude of it, not, I'm not sure of, but we do set our rates to be self-supporting and self-sustaining so that they can stand on their own. Right, that and, was and not that my question. Would not be. My question was, to what extent would the board not approving any increase for MVP this year affect MVP's RBC ratio? It would negatively impact it. By how much? I haven't done that calculation, so I don't know that. It's just the fact that if claims exceed our expectations and we have no premium to cover it, that would not be an actually sound rate. That would have an adverse impact on our reserve levels. Would it affect your RBC ratio by 1% or more? I, I can't speak to that. You don't know? Could it affect it by 10%? That's a calculation that we could perform. It's not one that I just have off the top of my head. Okay, I have no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Lombardo. Okay, let's move to board questions. Uh, before I do, I just want to note for the board, uh, there was some questions about data for 2020 claims. I expect that in past years, you've issued follow-up questions after the hearing for uh, questions that came up. Um, I anticipate that may be one that you consider when you're considering what follow-up hearing questions to ask. So with that, um, I'm gonna start with board member Holmes. It feels like a little bit of a lottery. We never sure who's going to be called upon next. I win or not. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Very, very helpful. Uh, appreciated it. Um, so as you said, the big issue seems to be COVID uh, and the COVID impact. And there's a lot of uncertainty related to the potential costs of COVID, right? We've sort of gone over that for the last few hours, um, last few days. So my question to you is with current unemployment rates and furloughs and wage stagnation who do you think can better afford to absorb potential downside financial risk associated with the COVID uncertainty mvp or the individual policyholder um it's a good question um 
depending on the, the magnitude of it, um, I mean, the, the logical explanation would be that MVP has more money in the bank than most, most people. Um, but that doesn't get to the point of what an actuarially sound rate is, and that's what we're establishing as an actuarially sound rate. Failing to uh, increase premiums commensurate with the way claims are increasing could potentially adversely affect reserve levels um, and uh, solvency issues and being able to provide members with peace of mind. But it is a really thin line that we're walking and it's challenging. I appreciate that. Um, so we've also heard varying assumptions about uh, deferred care and pent up demand and how pent up demand may be managed over the next year. Um, differing assumptions and, and sadly, uh, pent up demand is actually not new to Vermont at all. Um, for years, Vermonters have experienced long waits, especially for specialty services. So why if providers have not expanded hours and worked weekends to meet excess demand that we've had in the past, do we expect them to do so now for an extended period of time for not, of nine months? Yeah, similar issue does occur in, in, in both states where we operate, New York and Vermont, where it can take six months again with your specialist. Um, the concern is that the backlog has grown so much that it's going to be unsustainable. It's going to be kind of like an unbearable strain on the system. So that's why we're assuming that this is a unique circumstance that's going to actually accelerate and, and lead to increased work hours, working over weekends, items such as that. It's a unique circumstance. Have you had specific conversations with providers and hospitals that have said that they're opening up extra hours and expanding weekend hours? I mean, do you have, do you have data to support that this is actually going to happen? Personally, I have not. Conversations I've had with um, MVP employees that do have those conversations that speak with uh, providers, hospitals, have discussed extending hours, working weekends, items such as that. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, has MVP tried to estimate the dollar value uh, or the amount of waste or unnecessary care in the Vermont member population, just in general? Low value care, unnecessary care, waste. Any estimate of that that you have tried to do? So we have, I'm not familiar with us putting a dollar amount on that, but we do have a couple of different items. Uh, we have an SIC unit, Special Investigations Unit, that researches potential fraud patterns and um, abuse of the system. We also have uh, quality and credentialing. So we have NCQA credentialing for our Vermont population, and that that ensures that we have, that we're meeting a strict set of quality metrics to ensure that we're providing quality um, provider experience to our members. If providers don't meet those minimum requirements, then they're not allowed in the network. And um, to actually be able to identify specific cases, I'm not aware of any analysis, but we do have the framework in place to, uh, to ensure that we're not letting bad actors into the system. Uh, other than through our SIU unit. Um, so with that SIU unit, can you tell me a bit about the percentage of claims that you typically recover as a proportion, you know, or, or you know, as a part of that SIU unit, what, you know, percentage of claims you might recover for fraud or waste or abuse? Yep. For so, 2019 and what you're also anticipating for 2021. So we do not, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but I do remember that question being asked last year. Um, and the follow-up was that it was not a really large number. It wasn't something that would swing the the percentage increase by, you know, by by a significant amount. Um, we could follow up with additional information for the current year, but if it's consistent with what we've seen in prior years, it's a non-zero amount, but it's not an amount that is actually going to swing our uh, our rate increase to be something materially different than what it already is. So I would really appreciate a historical look back at, at the percentage of claims that you do recover um, with that uh, SIU unit and then what you're anticipating for this year and how that's baked into your rate would be appreciated. Um, what annual increase in wages and salaries is assumed in the 2021 administrative expenses? That detailed item um, 
I would have to follow up with our financial planning team. I know that there is a, a small increase, um, but I, I'm not sure what that specific number is. Okay, I'd appreciate that follow up as well. Um, uh, another question in the, um, if you could go to exhibit six, page two. Let me make sure I'm on the right page. Uh, this is a, a, an answer to a question about the comparison of actual to expected pharmacy allowed trend over time. And just in looking at this, the actual uh, materialized trend is significantly less than the expected trend year after year after year by a fairly large margin, um, which suggests that the expected trend rates seem to be, you know, overestimated year after year, and those are presumably baked into premium rates. So can you speak to me about why the miss is so large and why we should believe whatever the expected pharmacy allowed or pharmacy trend for 2021 is given this year? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. The pharmacy trend in and of itself is not telling. So when we produce our trend, when we receive our trend forecast from our PBM, it's assuming a static population where we're not basically whoever we had in the, and I believe we use 20, it's based on 2019 data. It's assuming that there won't be any changes to that population in 2020 or 2021. Um, because we've grown and our, and our risk profile has changed, those trend figures, the actual trends need to be normalized out for risk adjustment changes. Unfortunately, risk adjustment doesn't get to just the specific, one specific item that you can say, this is pharmacy related, that everything's kind of interrelated. But what I can speak to is the fact that our actual trends have come in favorable yet our risk adjustment payments have increased over time. So what that's telling me is that the morbidity of our population is healthier. So that would lead to a lower trend, but then we're paying back into risk adjustment a larger amount to normalize ourselves back. It's something that you can't really decouple it into one item or um, everything is intertwined, but it has to be looked at with market or morbidity changes uh, of our population as well as risk adjustment. And there's no way to quantify the net effect. I, I would say that's not that I'm aware of and I've thought about it and my team has thought about it and there's not a specific way that we've figured out to identify that. Um, if you could turn to exhibit nine, um, an another set of questions pages 17 at the bottom, but really the top of 18, um, in which MVP talks about the significant cost savings that have been materializing because of the uh, high use of telemedicine, in particular, the substitution of a telemedicine visit for an urgent care visit or a, an emergency room uh, visit. Substantial cost savings, um, significant cost savings, to use your words. And I'm just wondering, uh, how you factored that into your uh, cost estimates, medical cost utilization estimates for 2021 is the, you know, assuming that telemedicine is here to stay, how has that factored into your uh, trend going forward for 2021? So we've so definitely we seen an uptick in, uh, in telemedicine usage as the COVID pandemic has broken out. Um, it's still not relative to our overall cost of our book of business, it's still a very small amount. Um, and we are assuming that once, as people are learning how to navigate through the pandemic more intelligently, um, we're assuming that 2021 is gonna look more like 2019. So as a result, there isn't any sort of uh, explicit adjustment being made for continued uh, higher utilization of telemedicine. Even with that, I would say that um, the overall cost relative to the total projected claims for telemedicine, even if we did assume an increased utilization, uh, I don't, I wouldn't anticipate an overall material reduction to claims in the aggregate. Even though you talk about here a significant cost savings associated with telemedicine. 
And the I mean, total dollar amount. As a, yep. As a, I, I, yep. Um, and a total dollar amount, it could be, it can appear to be something like a, a substantial number on a percentage basis. And when you spread it out over 35,000 uh, members, it's it's a much smaller figure. Okay. Um, and my, my last question was, did you factor in any additional administrative costs to implement the uh, separate abortion billing that at the time that you submitted this filing, MVP submitted this filing, it was referenced, but has now changed. So I'm wondering, is there a specific administrative cost associated with separate abortion billing? I know that is something that was considered. I don't know specifically how much that is actually worth in the overall projection. Um, I would have to follow up with our financial planning team on that item. Okay, that would be great. Uh, I, I have some conf questions that are in some of the confidential materials, but I'm assuming we'll go into an executive session. So I will hold off on that. Does that sound good? Mike, Barber? Yeah, let's um, let's get through all the non-confidential questions you have. Um, and then uh, okay. we'll, we'll go through the steps of going into executive session for any confidential questions. Okay, then I am I am done. Thank you. Thank you. So just to let board members know, the order is however you are organized on my screen. <laughs> so the next up is Robin. Great. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, Robin. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Um, so I ha just have a couple of follow-up um, questions. Uh, which largely overlap with the areas that Jess asked about. So just to start with telehealth, um, you uh, in your actuarial memo provided some information about website traffic and number of sessions. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, that's in your pre-filed testimony. Um, do you have data on how many of the visits are with Vermont providers as opposed to either MVP staff or out-of-state mm -hmm. providers? Um, that is not something that I've seen that breakdown. That doesn't mean that it's not available if requested. It's just not a breakdown that I've seen. Okay. Um, and so it would be interesting to know that because I understand from your list of 22 that promoting primary care and care coordination is something that you're committed to. So understanding how your promotion of telehealth interacts with that priority would be helpful. So, But I'll plan on doing a follow-up. Yeah, and I, um, I'll just add to that a little bit. In the past, tele, so there's kind of two non-physical visits that you can have. One is we, we classify as telemedicine. The other one is telehealth. Yeah. Uh, telemedicine is using MVP's My Visit Now app, which is using the online care group, which, which is a national set of providers. Telehealth is, um, is a replacement for a physical visit with the PCP or the specialist that's in your community and up the street from your house. Um, so we, we do, we have seen an increase in both of those uh, during the pandemic, the exact splits, I can't speak to them. Okay, great. Thank you. And I, um, I, I would, and I can also do this, I think, as a follow-up, given your response to Jess, but it would be interesting to have the dollar figures and the percentage that you referenced in your answer to her question about the magnitude, but we can include that in a follow-up. Yeah. Um, do you know how many MVP uh, policyholders have COVID-related claims? Um. I, across our enterprise, I do not. I'm specifically I interested in Vermont, of course. Yeah, I know that we have somewhere around 50 inpatient admissions related to COVID as of the end of June uh, for Vermont commercial members. Great. Um, Jess asked a lot of my same questions, so I'm just jumping through them. Um, so then to follow up on your answer related to the source of information about providers working nights and weekends, I know you didn't speak to them personally, but do you have information or data from your medical management team in terms of who they spoke to in Vermont, which providers, how many providers? 
That's something I would have to speak specifically to um, other people at MVP about. Okay. Um, and then the last question I have, uh, I think maybe you may, may, it's not specifically in the confidential material, so I'm going to ask the question and then have you pause so that your attorney can indicate whether or not this should be a confidential answer, because um, okay. I don't want to bring it out if it's supposed to be confidential, but I'm not sure. So um, I know that MVP has been um, moving towards implementation of the ACO program. I was interested in your future plans around participation, including uh, potential changes mm -hmm. to payment methodologies and risk. I wonder if, uh not knowing what my uh, esteemed witness is going to say in response to that, I wonder if we could just ask that question in the confidential session, if we are going to be doing that in any event, if that's possible. And the reason why I'll just, for Mike's benefit, the reason why I thought it might be uh, included in the confidential portion is because in the answers to some of the questions about the ACO program, things like um, the risk pro the risk orders and the type of arrangement were marked as were marked as confidential. So I, I think it's similar. Yeah, I I think you're right. Um, we do need to figure that out before we go into executive session, though, because we should not be asking questions that call for non-confidential responses in the executive session. So Amron, is, does that sound right to you as the one who's been kind of working on the uh, confidentiality? request yes it does and i would say if we get a non-confidential answer during the executive session we can re-ask the question once we're back out i think that sounds like an appropriate approach thank you okay um let me just check my please Um, I did have one more question about the medical trend. Um, so, Matt, you had indicated in your testimony that you used the um, information you had about the Green Mountain Care Board approved hospital budget rates with some exceptions uh, with information from your contracting uh, department. I believe that one of those exceptions related to the UVM Health Network. Um, I, I, Again, I that was something that was in the confidential section who we okay, specifically sorry. were having conversations with. That's okay. All right. Well, then I will ask uh, about that specific negotiation, the confidential section. So that's my last question. Thank you. Okay, Maureen. Uh, great. Thanks. Hi, Matt. Um, I do have a few, I think that also would go into confidential, but um, the ones that aren't, uh, can you give an idea of what percent of admin costs are fixed? Um, I believe that's something that l &E had asked us to provide in their memo data set and it is around 50%. 50%, okay, that's what I would, that's, that seems like a, a fair number. Um, can you tell me what, does 1% hospital for the Vermont hospitals, what does 1% hospital rate increase translate to, to a total rate increase? Um, I would have to pull up our exact utilization. We do have that. Um, it's not, it's gonna be something that's less than 1% obviously yeah. for each year. Yeah. Um, right. To simplify it, approximately 80% of our claims uh, are processed through um, our medical claims, 20% are pharmacy, give or take 5%. And um, then there's a subset of them that are subject to the Vermont hospital budget. So it would be something, one year is something less than 1%, a 1% impact on trend um, on, on the hospital budgets for one year would be something that's less than 0.8% is my approximation, um, probably 0.5 to 0.7, but that's, that's an estimate. Okay. That's a calculation. So maybe 
0.3 to 0.5 because we also have to remember that only half the half of your volume comes from Vermont hospitals, I think, right? So whatever yes. we take for, I'm saying for Vermont hospitals, yep. there's a 1% increase, um, but maybe you can get back to us on the number. Yep. You know what I mean? I'm saying, I think you have about half is outside of Vermont or maybe a little less than that half is inside Vermont. Yeah, my, my mind was going to UVM physicians because I know they're subject to it and that they do take right. up of the physician costs. So, um, but that's a calculation we could do. And, you know, it doesn't seem unreasonable around a half percent. A little under, a little lower, I think, but we'll get the number, yeah. Um, and then just, I guess, and, and maybe this was a follow-up that we're going to get, but on the, the June pre-COVID, um, we know it's not, you said it's back to almost COVID, pre-COVID levels, but is it 80 to 90 percent? Is it? We're not seeing Vermont hospitals back near 100 percent. So, you know, we're, we're, they're coming back for sure, but I haven't heard of any in June that were at 100%. Um, there were many at 70, 80%. So just trying to get a read on what percent, you know, increase, and that may be a, have been a follow-up from, um, from Jay's questionings earlier, but just want to make sure we get that number. Okay. Something we can provide. Um, and then on the schedule uh, that we had looked at before under A18, um, and we talked a little bit about this, I think, last year too, where Memory. members can compare prices Sorry, which before. Pardon? Which, which, exhibit are we, which exhibit are we referencing? I apologize. Oh, sorry. Um, A, page 18. The one that also had the telemedicine that we were talking about. The exhibit number eight? A. No, A. Oh, a is a. in Alfred. I guess it's A, A, sorry. Thank you very You're much. Right. I wasn't good. Eight. A, page 18. I don't have an eight, A. I have. Eight the question is really just if you have a, if, what? The, the um, consumers have the ability to check prices before they go to providers. And I think we talked a little bit about that here. And as we know, we're saying, you know, everyone's pocketbooks are stretched. Um, a, I guess, how can we encourage consumers to do that more to the extent it's still convenient for them to find a provider in their area who may be a lower price, because often that impacts their, what they pay for deductibles and out-of-pockets, but then it should also carry forward to what MVP is paying. So, you know, what are what types of savings are you seeing there, and how can we push that? How can that, you guys push that harder? So it should help everybody. Yeah, so there's a few items to uh, unpack in there. Um, first is there isn't a way, that it's a separate system, the online cost tool calculator from our claim system. So tying those items back to, to one another is, um, it's not something that is, it would take a huge manual effort to identify that, but we are promoting uh, alternative ways of of accessing care, whether it's through our Try Telemedicine First uh, website or it's just through pro, uh, member communications, because I agree, as members make more intelligent decisions in terms of cost, that will reduce costs um, overall, which will pass on into premium rates in future years. To specifically identify how much that's in, that's been impacted, we don't have the ability to do that based on the way our systems are set up. Yeah. And can you talk about um, any other major cost saving initiatives that that are in the works and when we would expect to see the benefits of those? So from an administrative perspective, we're taking on a, a lean initiative to identify areas where um, we can replace um, manual intervention with a, a computer or robotics uh, behind the scenes. So something like, um, if it's a case manager or it's someone in um, a claims processing area, 
rather than them having to physically take copies and fax them or print them, we're automating those types of items um, in a hope to help reduce admin in the future. So those assumptions are, are definitely taken into consideration when we look at our 2021 costs, um, you know, staffing levels that will fluctuate as a result of that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's definitely a major initiative that we're undertaking to help rein in administrative costs. We're also reviewing any contracts that we have um, because we've been, we were very, we rolled out Microsoft Teams about a month before the pandemic broke. It worked out pretty well for us. Um, so we've had a pretty good transition to working from home um, and we're, we're reviewing contracts and, and how are we gonna approach our business in the future? There are, it, what I've heard based on conversations is some of the contracts and leases that we signed are not short term, they're longer term contracts. So they may not be realized anytime in the next year or two, but that is something that we are considering as an organization is how do we approach work uh, in the future post pandemic. Okay. Um, and then just back to the chart on six two, page two, the pharmacy trend. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the growth in the um, number of people, but it's it's still growing, but it's it's a little more stable, I would I would think. So it would seem, and you, and you said that um, you know basically it gets made up for in the risk transfer, but um, maybe I have it wrong. But if you got the pharmacy trend right or or closer to being more accurate to, to representative to what's been happening, um, then wouldn't just that just make the risk adjustment less when it came came to pass? I mean, I, I think it would be better to try to get, you know, this as close as you can. And if the trend has been better each year, um, you know, I don't think the risk adjustment, the forward risk adjustment would already be picking that up. So I just understand, you know, wouldn't it just be an offset if, if this were, if we had a lower pharmacy trend, then at the end of the year, there's a lot that goes into the risk adjustment. Um, so it was the question was, um, we cut out a little bit, but I, I'm gonna answer it as best as I can based on what I heard. Um, our rates are set taking 2019 experience and then normalizing for risk adjustment. That's projected to 2021 which is implicitly assuming that there won't be a population change. Um, but because of risk adjustment, we are agnostic to population changes. So if we do enroll a healthier population in 2021, um, then our claims will come down. But in theory, when we receive 2021 risk adjustment, it will be a higher payment to normalize us back up to that level. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and if you ask anything differently, that I didn't hear, then uh, please let me know. Uh, I guess it's just if we know, if we believe that that the trending for pharmacy has been better each year, wouldn't that come in? Wouldn't that change some of the assumptions that you have, um, just as you do for utilization trends and uh, you know on the medical side? If we were to reduce our trend. Um, expecting a healthier population, we would have to make a corresponding increase to our risk adjustment payment, which would basically put us back at the same point. So the fact is that we're assuming a static population that's normalized for risk adjustment. Um, and that that makes it, if we were to assume population changes, we'd have to also make a corresponding risk adjustment change. Okay. Um, and then I understand, you know, that this is for 2021, that electives may come come back from 2020 into 2021, and that that's the filing that we're looking at. But um, can you just, I guess, give me a yes or no question, yes or no answer to that? You know, any benefits that occurred in 2020 for Vermonters that didn't happen um, would have impacted the surplus for 2020. Will, will impact the surplus. So if we end up being favorable at the end of the day, which I know you said is too early to call right now, but uh, that will impact the surplus. Is that correct? If claims come in favorable, then that does fall to the bottom line in the short term. Okay. Uh, okay, that's all I have. Thanks. 
Thank you. Tom, do you have questions for Matt? I do, just a few. Um, so my first one uh, is just a very top side question. Oh, by the way, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> um, is uh, it's a very top side question. And uh, if you turn to page three of the first exhibit. And I'm I'm just looking at the written premium for this program at $248.9 million. So that, uh, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what that is. So that is your estimate, your projection at this point in time or when uh, this filing was made uh, of the premium uh, to be garnered from the 2020 uh, approved rates. Um. I would have to look if that is the projection for 2020 or 2021. Well, the 258 is, I think, the 2020, because if you add the 18.2 million onto it, you come to the 267, 204, 274 number exactly, yep. which is your 2021 20, number. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Page four does articulate that and break it out. So yes. the 2020 figure is 248 million. Right. And so when that rate was approved last August, this time last year, the projection was $207.7 million. And that number, that number, there's also, I can give you an exhibit where that number can be found, but I'm not sure if it's confidential or not, but that this is off, you know, what our website. Um, so I'm just wondering what are the moving parts between a 200, and I know some of its membership, but uh, between a $207.7 million projection after going through all this actuarial scrubbing, which it did, um, and now we're at 248.9 million is a projection, which is a 20% uh, difference. Yeah, that that is, it's driven by membership changes. Um, so our projected incurred claims at the time is our membership snapshot times our target loss ratio because we don't have a revised estimate when we're submitting our rates. Our membership uh, increased by approximately 20%, which is why the premium is also increasing by 20%. If it's not exact, it could be because benefits changed a little bit. Um, you know, maybe we saw a shift in our membership from uh, distribution of gold versus um, silver versus bronze, things like that. But in general, it's just reflecting our target loss ratio times our projected premium as of February 2020. And and, and in these uh, actuarial projections, I mean, there are estimates about what the ridership will be. So it get, all gets translated to a per member per month basis. But you think it's most of that difference is explained by the actual membership that showed up. Yeah, and um, you reference a 20% gain in, or 20% increase in premium and our incurred claims, that's, uh, I have 20% in my mind for the membership increase approximately, yep. so that, that hangs together for me. And just a quick question. Um, when you're, when, you know, at, at this point in time, we're looking at a 6.06% uh, increase. Um, that still is, is kind of out of uh, alignment with the all pair model uh, hope of a 3.5% total cost of care um, by 2022. And do you have any insight or any thoughts about that? And um, or is your actuarial analysis, as it should be, um, just completely independent of the fact that the state of Vermont has signed an agreement with the federal government, you know, for the all-payer model? Yeah, it's our rate is set based on our projection of incurred claims um, from 2019 to 2021. Our best estimate of what will actually happen in 2020 in 2021 is what's captured in our rates. Um, the three and a half percent figure that would be great if we can achieve that. Um, and you know, if we if we arrive at that, then that's that's fantastic because that will make premiums more affordable, more competitive. Um, but our rate is set so that's actually really sound, and our best estimate of that is 6.06 percent. Okay. So my next question is a quick one on um, just the, what I call the premium cliff. Um, and I just want to give a, an example that the data is 
on exhibit one page 110 you don't have to go there if you don't want to and the other is the uh, federal poverty guidelines in exhibit 21. so i'm looking at a um uh you know at at your chart on uh, page exhibit one page 110 that uh, talks about the uh 2021 exchange rates and i'm looking at a specific uh, amount associated with a couple, which is um, a uh, an analysis that Diva actually did on this exact plan for 2020 over 2019, um, and so uh, so the rate for a couple there is a thousand twenty dollars and fifty six cents um, a month for an uh, annual amount of twelve thousand two hundred and forty six dollars. Um, and the afford at 400% of poverty, the income uh, is 68,960, which means that that rate is a 17.8% uh, uh, percentage, 18.17.8% percent percentage of the couple's income. And at 68,000, that could be a couple, one making 30, one making 40, you know, maybe they're younger than I am, but in their late 40s or 50s, they might have a kid in college trying to save for retirement. So I'm trying to you know, put some feeling to it. Um, do you think that that 17.8% rate is affordable? That rate is, the rate is set to be affordable in the sense that it is an actually sound rate where we're doing everything we can to manage costs to be um, to be as low as possible, and that's what we're doing. And um, I recognize how large those claims can seem, or how high that premium can seem. But it, it goes back to I commented earlier about how skewed towards the right tail costs costs are. And I, I recognize that most people pay a significant amount of premium and don't incur a comparable amount of claims. But every year there are some people, and there's others that have chronic conditions that every year continue to drive the bulk of that, in this case, $1,020 premium rate. Um, and our rates are being set to be actuarially sound. And that's, that. Um, you know, as much as that 17% figure is intimidating, that is the cost of covering our block of business and providing these benefits. Now, maybe you're not familiar with this, but there was this study that was done by DIVA and DFR this last year. It was called the 2019 Report on Health Insurance Affordability in Merged Markets. And uh, the report cites uh, MVP as one of its uh, uh, you know, contributing stakeholders. So are you familiar with that report at all? I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. And um, it just has some... Uh, uh, it was done by Wakely, um, and it, it has uh, profiles of some op options that will flat help flatten the uh, bet, the, the premium cliff, and uh, you know a couple of them pretty cheap um, relatively to the problem. Um, so in terms of looking at your uh, trend um, uh, analysis, do you have a sense of what percent of the claims are associated with independent providers, providers that are independent of, of, of hospitals? We do have that breakdown. Um, I believe it's provided in one of the confidential exhibits. I just, I would have to refer to it to, to okay. get it to my arms. If you, can point, if you can point me to it, I, I, you know, you don't have to do it right now. We can do it uh, later on yep. in, in the confidential session, but um, uh let's see so i i want to ask uh probably my last question mike will be happy um it's uh i'm looking at uh, this uh, wellness benefit in addition uh at the 600 dollars wellness benefit i started to ask blue cross blue shield about it yesterday that's how confused all this stuff gets but um and then i realized it was you guys um so i wasn't clear uh where it talks about um 88 cents per member per month whether that applied to all 400 and, um, 443,766 member months, or was that just applied to the people who um, uh, enrolled in the rider? If you purchase a non-standard plan, it's automatically included in your benefits. And that 88 cent load is a plan specific adjustment. So if you purchase a standard plan, 
that load is not included in your rates. If you purchase a non sara plan, it is included in the rates. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, morning, Mr. Lombardo. Um, can you refresh morning. my memory? Does MVP own or lease the uh, corporate headquarters in Schenectady? We lease them. Okay. And you said that uh, you had long-term obligations on that. So like the rest of the world, many people are trying to figure out who needs to go back to the office. Uh, um, but that's a, a sticky issue as far as still having to have the responsibility for the space. Yeah, I don't know a ton of details about it, um, but yes, that is a that is something that we have a COVID-19 workforce uh, task planning committee that is looking at what does the future look like? What does the post-pandemic world look like? And these are all items that we're considering. And um, did MVP see a significant drop in um, expenses related to, for example, um, travel to conferences, um, use of the copier, um, those type of uh, things, office supplies. Those, yep, the, there were decreases to costs. Those are uh, good examples. We did cancel uh, conferences and travel and, and uh, copying is reduced. I'm in the office today for the first time since mid-March and there's only one other person on the floor that I've seen other than me. Um, so yes, reduced copy costs, but we are, there are increased costs for other items. I know we had to boost our VPN. Um, we, the VPN that we previously had prior to the pandemic, that wasn't something that could support, um, you know, 95% of our workforce, 95% plus working from home. So as much as there are decreases to cost for certain items, there are some, there are offsets in other places. Okay. Um, you know, everything, uh, we try to focus on actuarial value and yet, um, Clearly this year, the theme is uncertainty. Um, everything is somewhat speculative in nature. Um, you've created a scenario um, based on how you will see pent up demand met going into the first few months of 2021 um, and uh, a resumption to more normal times. Um, in that you kind of referred to how things seem to normalize in June but it, could it just be that June was making up for two and a half months previous? And um, couldn't a likely scenario be um, a, a possibility? I'm not saying it's a probability, but a possibility that um, people will have fear to go back to medical settings, so utilization will be reduced, especially in settings like the ER, with the cancellation of fall sports um, there, and not just uh, for students, but um, adults and things like that, that there'll be a lot less orthopedic procedures and um, carrying that forward, even those, though those initial claims may fall into 2020, the PT and, and things going into 2021 may be reduced. Couldn't we likewise see a reduction in infectious disease um, because uh, people are washing their hands, people are being socially distant, they're not uh, um, driving as much, um, things like that. So couldn't just as likely a scenario be um, a reduction? It's, there's a lot of scenarios that can take place. Um, based on our, what we're seeing, our conversations with providers, with our, my, our internal folks, we're expecting 2021 our scenario, our best estimate is that 2021 will look like a pre-pandemic world, but we do recognize that there could be cancellations or redu reductions because there are fewer people that are going to be skiing this year that could blow out their knee, um, stuff like that. But assuming that the, the vaccination is approved early enough in 2021, we expect that for the most part, 2021 will have a higher, will, will just be a more normal year. Have you seen any increase in retirements from older providers? That's not something I know off the top of my head. That would be something that we'd have to 
I'd have to follow up with our provider team. Um, I don't know if that's something that they track. I can't guarantee we could get that information, but um, the fear of, of, of COVID is, is definitely um, is definitely a very real issue and, and recognizing that the elder population is higher risk. Um, that's something though that I don't know off the top of my head. So we get to see, this, is, this has no relationship to the hearing today, but we get to see um, Vermont numbers, we get to see North Country numbers, we get to see state of New York numbers. I'm just curious how you and the Capital District are doing. Are, do you feel safe walking the streets down there? Or? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, I, it's where I live, um, you know, it depends on where you are. Where I grew up, it's much more urban. Where I currently live is much more like Vermont, where most of Vermont, where um, there's space between the houses, right? And um, I, I feel a little bit safer walking outside there. It's still not, I still haven't hung out with any of my friends. So all I've seen is my parents, and my in-laws, you know, it's a weird world. Uh, and we're just trying to be as cautious as possible as a family. And it's, you know, be cognizant of the people around us, not just ourselves and my, and my wife and my two kids, but also my family. And, you know, I, um, it's, I hope that you guys are doing well too. You know, it's a, it's just such a strange world. You just want this to get over so that people can get back to normal and be healthy again and not worry and live in fear. So. I think for the majority, we all feel very grateful that we live in an area where there is social distancing just because of our uh, rural nature. So we're blessed that way. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you asking that question. Appreciate that. So before we go through the mechanics of uh, an executive session, Mr. Carney, do you have any redirect for Matt on the non-confidential questions and answers? I just have one question. Uh, Matt, how much time have you had to spend with your in-laws? Enough. I mean, you know, I this is, I actually have a great relationship with my in-laws. I know I enjoy them, um, but thanks, thanks for trying to corner me. <laughs> Thank you. That's Remember, it's recorded. <laughs> Transcribed, even. Um, so, so I we did this yesterday. Um, so I think you're familiar with the Open Meetings Act um, <laughs> and the two bases that that. You guys uh, voted to go into executive session on yesterday were the confidential documents exception or provision, sorry, um, and contract negotiations. I've heard some of you have questions about confidential materials. Uh, so that, so it that sounds like that's a basis that you might want to go into executive session for. I don't know that you also have questions generally about. Contract negotiations. <laughs> just got a whoop about that. I think my question that I asked related to some of the unit cost assumptions could veer into contract negotiations. Okay, that's helpful because to go into executive session on that basis, uh, we need a finding that. Um, premature public knowledge would place um, a person at a substantial disadvantage, in this case, I, MVP. Um, so do you feel comfortable uh, finding that, or do you need testimony um, to establish that fact? I think just generally, you, based on common sense and your kind of experience, I think you might be able to find that, but um, that's really a question for the maker of the motion and the board. So uh, since I'm assuming I will be the maker of the motion, um, uh, why don't I just ask Matt one question related to that, which is um, uh, earlier on, Matt, I started to ask you a question related to contract negotiations with the UVM health health network. Could you briefly describe how it might put your company um, 
at a disadvantage if we were to ask you about those contract negotiations in a public setting? And I would just uh, back caution you to the extent that this does get into confidential information. Please, please answer the question at a high level without without identifying any confidential information. Sure. Um, it's, our contracts are our contracts and our discount rates are. Um, it's kind of like in a poker game. If you were showing off your, the cards that you were holding, it would give the the competitor or the other opponents an advantage on you. And um, in this case, it's not something. If if Blue Cross um, is on the phone and they hear anything about that, that's something that they could leverage in their contract negotiations with UVMC um, and try to gain a leg up on us from a competitive standpoint. Thank you. Uh, I'm comfortable with that answer um, as the maker of the motion. Uh, can I ask if other board members need more? Nope. No. Okay, so then why don't I go ahead and make a motion that we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing um, contract negotiations with a finding that public disclosure of that information would constitute, uh, uh, would, would create harm for uh, MVP given the premature public knowledge. I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and then I need to make off. a second motion um, that we also, in our executive session, um, discuss uh, what information related to confidential materials provided in the filing. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the board has moved to go into executive session to discuss uh, contracts and confidential exhibits in the binders. Um, or materials in the binders. Um, the next step, I think, is to determine who needs to be in that executive session. So obviously the attorneys for the parties, uh, the witness, the board members, board staff, uh, and Lewis and Ellis is a witness and bound by confidentiality in these proceedings. Anyone else we need to include in the executive session, uh, Mr. Carnegie or Mr. Angoff? I don't believe so. No, sir. Okay. Um, Actually, uh, I'm sorry, Director Barber. Uh, Susan Gretkowski may be on the line as well. She was well known by the board. Uh, uh, might want to have her uh, in the confidential session as well, if that's appropriate. I agree. And obviously the court reporter. So um, I don't think there's anything. I mean, just obviously, as we discussed yesterday, I'll caution uh, everyone that Really, the questioning has to stick to the confidential materials. If there's anything that comes up that's not confidential, we can go back into the open session and discuss that. So with that, um, if everyone could uh, sorry, I'm just getting a text suggesting we might want to go to lunch and then do this. Um, Maybe do this and then go to lunch. <laughs> that way you can tell people when to come back. Yeah, I agree. It's okay, so if everyone could hang up this line, uh, we'll obviously keep the line open for the public, um, and then we'll uh, call into the other line. Um, okay. It's important that we hang up, right? I'm sorry, what? I said it's really important that we hang up because you can't have two lines open. Yes. Mike, do we want to 
indicate what time we'll reconvene That's for the okay. public? Thank you for reminding me. So um, once you vote to go out of executive session, why don't we take a lunch? Uh, it's about that hour. Um, and then reconvene at guessing the executive session will last maybe till 12.30, so 1.30. But I think we're doing okay on time. I yep. wonder if one might be a better number. Split the baby, 115. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Whenever I don't want. care. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, let's say 115. At 430, I think uh, the 115 is a, gives us that extra 15 minutes. Right. Okay, let's do that. So let's hang up, go into the executive session, take a lunch, come back at 115. Okay. Thank you. Thank See you. In you. A minute. Thank you.